with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> If I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today... <clears throat> Deputy Director of Research and Policy at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Also a member of the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies at Columbia University. Stephen Wertheim <clears throat> on his book, Tomorrow the World, The Birth of U.S. Global Supremacy. Meanwhile, Biden continues to hold a strong polling lead. And the Thursday debate is on, including Mike's That Mute. Meanwhile, COVID exploding in red and purple parts of the country, Wisconsin's hospitals are overwhelmed. Pelosi's deadline for a stimulus looms. And supposedly some progress on a potential deal. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court handed Democrats a Pennsylvania victory, but also perhaps a general election nightmare. Trump's Intel head says it's not. 50 former Intel heads say it is. More on Rudy Giuliani's attack on Hunter Biden. The Government Accountability Office to investigate Trump's COVID CDC interference. Meanwhile, North Carolina Senate looking good for Dems. Iowa even better. Florida shatters its first day voting record. And Texas. More people have now early voted in Texas than the number of people who voted for Donald Trump in Texas in 2016. Sadly, more than 6 million households, however, have missed their rent or mortgage payments in September. Texas social workers can now bar LGBTQ folks as clients in the U.S. to sue Google as an illegal monopoly. All this and more on today's program Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a lot of things to cover today. A lot of things to cover. <clears throat> um, I really don't know how to interpret, to be honest with you, that figure that more people have now early voted in Texas than the number of people who voted for Donald Trump in, in Texas in 2016. I mean, it 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 sounds impressive, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything in terms of the outcome of the election. All of those people could be cannibalizing the voting that they would have taken place on on election day. We, we just don't know. Uh, nevertheless, if you are in one of those states, New York is not one of them yet, where you can actually vote in person early. You can get your absentee ballot uh, in, um, in New York, and you can do it for any reason at this point. Uh, but <clears throat> if you're in one of those states where you can vote early, by all means, do it. Um, it would be very nice, I mean, for me personally, but probably more importantly for uh, the country and the world, uh, if uh, Florida people voted early there and uh, voted for uh, uh, Joe Biden, and uh, we could call Florida on Tuesday night, two weeks from today at 10 p.m., and then we could all maybe get some sleep for the next, I don't know. I guess it would probably be, I don't know, probably 11 hours in my case, not even eight hours, probably seven hours to sleep. But nevertheless, you get the point. Uh, so if you have the opportunity to go and vote, uh, please do by all means. Um, 
apropos of our guest today, we should we should do this uh, clip. It was um, sort of funny, as you know, uh, football is being played, but uh, very few people in the stands. Um, and they're pumping in the sound of of more people. They did this with basketball too, although it was the I, I still can't even quite figure out what was going on there. It was like a, a couple hundred people on Zoom, essentially sitting, sort of looking like they were sitting in the stands, and then they pumped in uh, sound. I mean, it is um, it's a little bit it's a little bit bizarre, uh, highly futuristic. But what are you going to do? There's a pandemic going on, and you know, you don't want people uh, cramped into a football stadium. So here is the game. <clears throat> this was in, uh, in, in Tampa Bay, right? Where, what game was this, guys? Because I'm not going to watch anything that involves Tom Brady anymore. T- Tampa Bay and whoever they played on Sunday. Let's see. I, I'm not up on things. <laughs> I've had no interest in uh, sports during this era. I mean. Yeah. Um, the Packers. Packers. Um, and I don't, I don't even know how, um, how Tom Brady did since he's, you know, flown the coop. But I don't think he's doing very well. But that doesn't, you know, I'm not going to let that mar my, my feelings for him. Nevertheless, <clears throat> the game was called by Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. And uh, we had another hot mic situation. There's been a lot of those uh, hot mic things going on these days, apparently. You know, Zoom meetings and whatnot. But Not here. Not here. We never do that. Uh, but here's Joe, uh, Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. And there's a military flyover, which is uh, very apropos. Um, well, here, listen to what they say, because uh, our, our guest uh, later in the program is Stephen Wertheim. And he has written a, a book which addresses why we are the military power we are. But uh, here is uh, Joe Buck and Troy Aikman sort of maybe in some ways sort of uh, investigating that question around the edges anyways it's a lot of jet fuel just to do a little flyover that's your hard-earned money and your tax dollars at work that stuff ain't happening with kamala biden ticket and i'll tell you that right now partner yeah they did not <clears throat> they did not realize that um <laughs> That was um, that that was hot, but I there I I don't know. I appreciate the sentiments, although I wonder if Troy Aikman was saying that disparagingly. I don't I don't want to make any. I I have no idea, but um, rest assured uh, it's that also, the right has decided that he is saying it uh, glowingly of of Biden and Harris. Yeah, they're going to put an end to it, and it's disgusting that Troy Aikman's applauding that. Yeah, I, I mean, is I, I, I mean, it would be nice if that was the case. Frankly, yeah. Why do we do that? In fact, there's a lot of questions around why we have, you know, why do we have such militaristic shows at at sporting events? Um, I think our next guest may have some ideas on that. Uh, but it is a, a fascinating look at the um, the period right before we entered the war and by that war i mean world war ii when our elite policymakers decided that basically that we were going to be a world power military power and that has um those decisions made now 80 years ago um continue to be devilous i think today uh we'll talk about that in a moment first uh Word from our sponsors. Did you know that 70% of people say they want to use natural products, but only 2% do? Uh, Why is that? It's because what they sell at the store is from the biggest companies and not necessarily the ones that are best for you. So how do you get natural products, make it convenient, and know that you're getting something of quality? Introducing Grove Collaborative. Grove is the online marketplace that delivers healthy home, beauty, and personal care products directly to you. Grove Collaborative takes the guesswork out of going green. Every Grove.co product is guaranteed to be good for you, your family, your home, and the planet. Uh, I have been, I guess I've been using this basically since we started to, um, they started to sponsor the show. I got deep into uh, Grove during the uh the the shutdown 
the first part of the choir, as they say, uh, because they, um, they were stocked with all the stuff that I want. Now, everybody around this office, well, nobody's here now, but uh, when they are here, know that I'm extremely sensitive uh, to uh, smells. So I get the unscented seventh generation stuff. That's what I've been getting forever. I mean, I like the Mrs. Myers products. A lot of people like them, but I like no smell. And so that has been the one that I have been using the most. However, I have also, over the past couple of months, gotten big time into the Grove Collaborative products themselves. And so now, every bathroom, every, everywhere there's a sink in my life, there is a Grove Collaborative soap dispenser, and I now buy the refillable bags of clear, scent-free hand soap from Grove Collaborative, and I love it. And then I actually use like a mint uh, cleaner that they they sell as well that I think is a, maybe a Mrs. Myers that I actually, I can, I can tolerate the smell. I actually sort of like it. So uh, there's a whole range of amazing products at Grove Collaborative, all of them natural products, uh, much healthier for your kids, for your pets, for you. With Grove, you don't have to shop multiple stores. You don't have to search endlessly online. All the natural goods you need for you and your family. Join over 2 million households who have trusted Grove Collaborative to make their homes happier and healthier. Plus, shipping is fast and free on your first order. For a limited time, when my listeners go to grove.co slash majority, you'll get a free cleaning gift set plus free shipping with your first order. Go to grove.co. That's C-O. Not, not, not the typical com. It's grove.co slash majority. Get this exclusive offer. Grove.co slash majority. Check it out. Also, today, one of our sponsors, my favorite one, Sunset Lake CBD. They are a farm up in uh, Burlington, Vermont, outside of, outside of Burlington. The dairy farm that was uh, providing milk for Ben and Jerry's ice cream, they still do, but they decided to uh, diversify. And uh, they have great business practices, $15 minimum wage. They have, um, they, have, uh, uh, they have expanded largely because of our audience finding their products and loving their products. They went from 10 people, less than 10 people in 2019 to more than 20 for uh, this year's uh, 2020 uh, harvest. They're at introducing new strains for people who like to uh, smoke CBD. Hand-trimmed flour, smalls, keef. They got a sour special sauce. They got a super uh, sour space candy, among others. Um, Matt, they said they're going to send you a sample. So you get a, a little sample of the smoking. But, um, you know, I, where is that? I have it right here in front of me, actually. The... Um, I'm looking at a uh, 2018 study about cannabis and joint scientific evidence for the alleviation of osteoarthritis pain by cannabinoids. I'm trying to read that because somebody was, uh, was telling me about, is there like any type of evidence to the claim that this helps with arthritis, other than the fact that we've had people write us. Um, but I can tell you that for me, I use it, it helps me sleep, tinctures, uh, gummies, they have a uh, CBD infused coffee that is amazing. And the way that they grow their stuff, they're doing it in conjunction with the University of Vermont regenerative agriculture um, process. They don't use pesticides. What they use is called integrated pest management, IPM. I know this because they sell a uh, fruit like that at my co-op. And like I say, it's, it's, they do it through the University of Vermont Extension, and their IPM involves purchasing eggs of parasites, parasitic wasps, and predatory assassin bugs. The eggs are overnighted. They, they're sent to them. They come on small sheets of paper that they place throughout the field to hatch. And then once these bugs get mature, they prey upon all the unwanted pests. So everything is natural. They're creating an ecosystem and they're doing it with the help of the University of Vermont. So they're not bringing in like, you know, murder hornets or whatever. Um, but these, uh, they deal with corn borer, aphids, spider mites, and leaf hoppers. And in most of commercial agriculture, what farmers do is they spray 
and they spray chemicals that end up in your watershed. They do not do that at sunsetlakecbd.com. You can go there now. Left is best is the coupon code. Left is best. One word, get 20% off all your CBD products. Left is best. Check it out uh, right now. Sunsetlakecbd.com. You will not um, be disappointed. I promise you. All right. I'd like to welcome to the show the um, Deputy Director of Research and Policy at the Quincy Institute for uh, Responsible Statecraft and a research scholar at the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies at Columbia University, author of Tomorrow the World, The Birth of U.S. Global Supremacy. Stephen Wertheim, welcome to the program. Great to be with you. Um, I, 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 I found your book fascinating. And, uh, and I want to talk about sort of, uh, I want to put a pin in this, but I want to come back around to just this notion of, of the importance of, you know, I guess what, what people call revision, revisionist history, but uh, that, that sounds, I think, to the layperson problematic. Uh, but, but it is, it is really just the idea of, of taking um, things that we have assumed in many respects as, as I don't know, foregone conclusions and or or, uh, or history, and in examining these these things that have otherwise been unexamined. And what you have examined is how we became the a depending on on who's talking a hyperpower, the world superpower, and we did this um, in relatively short order relative to where we were. And you look specifically at uh, more or less a, a less than two year period uh, in 1940, uh, before we get into uh, World War II, before uh, Pearl Harbor, where this was a conscious decision. Tell us, like, where were we both in terms of the size of our military and the relationship to the rest of the world? And also, I guess, intellectually or dispositionally in terms of, of being a power at that time? Well, thank you. And you're right. Revisionist history is just what academic historians do. So it's absolutely necessary. So the United States uh, coming into World War II, nobody thought the United States would get involved in the war initially uh, or should, uh, much less become the preeminent military power after the war. In fact, in 1939, the soon to be British ambassador to the United States, Lord Lothian, comes to the White House and actually urges President Roosevelt, FDR, you know, please take the torch of world leadership from Great Britain. And FDR isn't having it. He doesn't want to do that at all. You guys should bear the burden. Uh, we're comfortable with our traditional conception going back to the founding of the country of, yes, uh, exerting U.S. interests uh, quite a bit, expanding in the new world domain, but in the corrupt world of power politics centered in Europe, and Asia, it just doesn't affect the United States because the United States is quite secure uh, behind its oceans. And so even at that late date, FDR was not interested and said what the British need is a good stiff grog. Get out of my office, basically. And so when the war starts uh, in the, at the end of 1939 and throughout the so-called period of the phony war up to the spring of 1940, uh, even Americans that have gathered to do some secret post-war planning for the State Department or in institutions like the Council on Foreign Relations, they're still thinking in traditional terms about America's role in the world. Uh, you know, the oceans provide incredible security against any outside invasion of the United States. Um, yes, the United States was already a, a colonial power, was a great power, and I don't want to deny anybody who would say that the United States uh, was an aggressive power prior to then. It absolutely was. But, but, it's uh, uh, policing of the new world domain in the Western hemisphere had always been premised on the idea that uh, the whole point was to preserve this special place of freedom uh, and not get involved, entangled in the corrupt old world. And that lesson had actually strengthened in the aftermath of World War I, once Americans, both left and right, had seen uh, how destructive that war was. So in other words, at that time, the U.S. was um, was both had basically created a um, a philosophy 
emanating out of the founding on some level that was we're happy being a regional imperialist if you will right like or i mean i mean for for lack of a better term like we're we're happy with our 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 we want to be in charge of our domain but we're happy just to have a limited defined domain that is essentially this hemisphere this quarter sphere that's right so the monroe doctrine had pronounced very ambitiously at the time that uh, Europeans should eventually uh, leave the entire Western Hemisphere. The United States at the time didn't have the Navy to back any of that up, but it kind of put forward this philosophy of history that uh, if uh, Americans in the New World are left to choose their own form of government, it will be a basically Republican form of government. The United States was there to hopefully uh, see that happen. And here's the key, it recipro re recipro reciprocally forswore U.S. meddling in Europe. So leave the Europeans to do their thing, and they should leave us to do our thing. And and our military was, what, like a number 16 in the world at that time? Oh, yeah, the, the U.S. Army was uh, 19th in size coming into World War uh, two, uh, it was uh, smaller than, I believe, the Belgian, no, the Dutch, even the Dutch army. So it was really small. And after, so the, the key turning point that I found wasn't Pearl Harbor at the end of 1941. It was the Nazi conquest of France, uh, which really overturned the balance of power in Europe uh, in the middle of 1940. That was the key the key event. And at that point, everybody in the United States, including the people who were called isolationists, and we can talk about why that's not at all correct. Um, you know, everybody realized the United States has a one ocean Navy. That Navy was stationed in the Pacific in part to uh, guard uh, U.S. Uh, colonies and territories then like Hawaii and the Philippines. Uh, and, you know, what if the Nazis were to uh, complete the conquest of Britain? Uh, and then, you know, potentially seize the British fleet, which really protected the United States in the Atlantic. So everybody could agree the United States, at a minimum, should build up its defenses dramatically uh, to guard the entire Western Hemisphere. Uh, but one side wanted to go further than that, uh, became more ambitious. And that's where we get the de de decision for global dominance. Yeah, let's. I mean, uh, uh, tell us about that because they, they, the, and it was through the the Council of Foreign Relations that much of this, um, I guess, uh, scenario assessing was was played out, and and there was this notion of okay, what if we just, what if we just control our quartosphere? Let's say the war rages on. Uh, Hitler um, conquers all of Europe, and can we live just as the quarter, you know, with dominance over our quarter sphere, or can we live with dominance over just our hemisphere? W walk us through that, th those debates, and like what the underlying premise was that brought these folks to the answer no. <laughs> yeah, this blew my mind because I did not expect coming into the archives to see such direct planning uh, for you know, how much of the world does the United States need to have, which is what the State Department asked these planners in the Council on Foreign Relations to determine in the wake of the fall of France. And so between uh, uh, the summer of 1940 and October, uh, the economists in this group uh, you know, look at different scenarios. At first they think, well, the Nazis have mastered uh, offensive warfare. They're going to defeat Britain and they're going to be the rulers of Europe for as far as we can see into the future. The United States is itself pretty weak and will be confined to what they call the quarter sphere, North America, as well as uh, kind of extending down to where Brazil juts out into the Atlantic. And here's the interesting thing. I mean, these are some of the most esteemed economists at the time. They calculated that for the United States, this was not that bad. The U.S. economy was quite inward. It did not depend on foreign, much foreign trade, especially after the Depression, uh, for prosperity for Americans. And so it was okay, the quarter sphere. 
um, if you know United States was only trading in that small block, uh, as well as militarily defending that part of the world, you know the American people would be prosperous and the United States would be safe. Um, it'd be very hard. Everybody agreed on this for um, even a Nazi-led Europe, as bad as that would be, uh, to go across the oceans with no territorial foothold in the Western Hemisphere and mount a successful invasion of the United States. That just really wasn't the fear. Right. So the lines would be too long and it would just be, technologically speaking, it just wouldn't be doable at that point. And even air power actually um, aided the defense of the coastlines. Um, so, you know, you could bomb uh, a good ways, but what would that achieve? And so, you know, as Britain hung on against the onslaught from the Luftwaffe, um, people who were against intervention in the war pointed to that and said, you know, if the English Channel affords Britain this defense, imagine what the Atlantic right. would do. But, you know, the United States was always historically committed to uh, guarding the Western Hemisphere. And so pretty soon the planners in the Council on Foreign Relations realized this is politically, you know, the, the quarter sphere is politically non-viable. In fact, even the, uh, the non-interventionists at the time wanted the United States to defend the entire Western Hemisphere. This is the quintessential group called isolationists. You know, ask Central Americans, South Americans, whether that sounds like isolationism to them. You know, we can object to what they came up with, but right. isolationism, I don't think so. So anyway, uh, well, so then what the was the motivation? I mean, yeah. What was the, well, I mean, was that, I mean, was that, you know, and, and I know you talk about um, there were sort of three justifications for this primacy uh, that you mm. go through in terms of, you know, having, I guess, various notions of like an obligation or, you know, sort of a, uh, uh, like a like almost like a, a neighborly obligation that sort of morphs into like a paternal obligation, I mean, et cetera. And we can walk through that, but I'm just really curious. Okay. At that point, if we, if, if we're sitting around and we say like, you know what, we could, this is like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just imagining a risk board, right. Where, uh, like, basically like I can defend this, uh, Cam right. and I can, I can defend this area. And, you know, we're, we're convinced that we have enough natural resources that we're going to be okay. Um, why, what was the, what was the sense of like, well, you know what, cordosphere is not going to be enough. We're going to need to do the, the right the here. Cause it, it doesn't sound like it's a need, right? Exactly. Sounds, what, what was it, what was it that motivated that? So my conclusion as you go through these plans is that actually the plans are kind of justifying a conclusion that the planners want to get to. So that's where your question comes in. I think this, I think it was widely acknowledged that the United States did not need out of, you know, uh, for its safety or for its prosperity to become the dominant power in the world. But there was a, it wasn't ideal either for the United States to be quote unquote isolated in the Western hemisphere while potentially Europe and Asia fell to totalitarian powers. This denied something that American elites and some of the public as well um, valued and felt was not necessarily you know, a strict necessity for survival, but was nevertheless valuable. The United States was supposed to be ex an exceptionalist country that would define the future of world history preferably not by force, but with the specter that totalitarian powers, the Axis powers could dominate Europe and Asia. Interventionists came to the view that only by having military supremacy across the globe could the United States truly be an exceptional power and continue to define the future of world history. Likewise, traditional, some people who call themselves internationalists they were willing to discard their old aversion to getting involved in power politics, which internationalists were always supposed to, to overcome. That was the essence of internationalism in favor of making sure that the United States could trade 
um, and relate to the world, travel, and basically have a generally favorable world order. And this is the phrase that they used again and again, world order. This was at stake to them. And it isn't easy to understand. And in some sense, it might be irreducible. There's a kind of sense of civilization is on the line, the general nature of the world and its history and America's place on it in that history is on the line. I mean, it, it, I, I mean, I guess maybe it is frustrating because it may not be irredu irreducible, but I, I, like on one level, it sounds almost there's a missionary quality to it. Uh, and I wonder how much of it is, um, how much of it is religious or how much of it is maybe, I don't know, even more narrowly tailored. Like, um, you know, some of those economists like, well, actually I owned a, uh, gold mine in, uh, you know, um, a country in, you know, in, in Africa and, uh, that won't be in our hemispheric, um, you know, power. So like <laughs> me and my family really want yeah. that gold mine. I mean, how much of it. I mean, where, you know, like, I mean, are, were there elements, let me put it this way, instead of re reducing it down, were there elements of all of that? Because it also sounds like, I mean, the idea of like, look, we want to keep our options open so that, and we have this notion of modern humanity, which allows us to travel and exchange ideas. And by establishing ourselves as this type of force, we will at least promote that in a soft manner. Uh, as right. opposed to being so insignificant that we can't. Um, I mean, how do, does it range through all those things? It does. And on both sides of the debate, you know, there are material interests like the executives of Sears Roebuck were actually anti-interventionists. Uh, and uh, so was, you know, Democratic Socialist Norman Thomas, as well as the anti-Semitic aviator Charles Lindbergh. And on the interventionist uh, turned internationalist side, there was, you know, a, a whole coalition of people as well um, who had different interests. But all these these changes happen um, amongst so many people at once that I I'm I'm glad to say I don't think there's like a conspiracy of you know this person had investments that they wanted to protect you know in in East Asia and that's basically the reason why the United States you know decided it would ensure that the Axis powers couldn't win and that the United States would. Separate question: right. Become the dominant power from 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 then on. So I think there's a whole matrix of uh, concepts, including you know this missionary quality you you pointed to. I think is really important because once we get past the idea that any of this was a strict necessity for the United States, we're left with this kind of general sense of obligation uh, for the state of the world and a world in which the United States would be a defining, maybe the defining feature. So, and, and what was, I mean, was it just simply the idea of, of, of Germany being this aggressive that created these various strains of, of thought? I mean, like it, it feels like there's an explosion, you know, like almost like a, a cultural intellectual explosion that's going on. I guess this is also sort of coupled with being on the precipice um, it, when it comes to the economics of the country. And I mean, I, I guess, you know, it's a, a highly tense uh, era as if uh, it's hard for people to understand that now these days. But I mean, that's what it sounds like. It was just like a cauldron. And so there's all these different sort of like cross currents going around that are trying to make this decision. And, and so how did the decision to become a superpower essentially, how did, the, how did they settle on that? Like what was the mechanism in which they decided, okay, let's take a vote and uh, this is what we're gonna be for the next 80 years? Well, there was definitely no vote and that's important. Uh, instead, there was a lot of discussion in elite circles and explicit post-war planning happening before the United States was in the war. Uh, and so I think there comes to be a kind of political consensus around this issue in 1941. And that's where you see you know, people like Henry Luce, a publishing mogul, he took to the pages of his own Life magazine, which is a nice trick if you can own a major publication, and announced that the United States was the, the new Britain for 
the 20th century. It was, as he put it, the American century. Uh, and so um, the debate was, you know, it was both a decision and in a way, you know, carefully um, circumscribed. I mean, the American people didn't exactly sign up for a perpetual project of policing the world. And indeed, in 1945, after the war ended, there was great support for uh, as much demobilization as, as possible, which was partially achieved for a little period of time before the, the Cold War reversed course. So um, there's a decision, but that decision that I focus on really happens in these elite circles. And even the elite, there's some divisions there, like John Foster Dulles, uh, a, you know, the, the Cold Warrior Secretary of State in the 1950s, is still not really convinced in 1941. And when Roosevelt and Churchill announce the Atlantic Charter toward the end of 1941, the first official declaration of post-war aims, and it's so clear that they're envisioning um, Anglo-Saxon dominance, well, that's the phrase, exactly the phrase that John Foster Dulles uses in criticizing the Atlantic Charter as being a kind of vision of, of imperialism that Americans were always opposed to. So it is Pearl Harbor that really does settle the debate in a definitive way, I think, as the people who were opposed to US intervention in the war and skeptical of uh, US uh, global leadership after the war they get defeated and they, you know, get behind the, the, the war effort. And from then on, what I see is uh, there's a process of um, ideological legitimization uh, that occurs uh, in the period of World War. Uh, and so by 1945, historians have now written these new narratives of how the United States had always struggled between this battle between isolationists and internationalists. Uh, and now it was time to embrace internationalism. They're reading back this whole category of isolationism uh, to the founding of the Republic when the term itself wasn't even used until the 1930s and 40s. And then when it was used, it was used almost exclusively as an epithet against people who, um, you know, for various reasons, uh, and people who also consider themselves to be internationalists, wanted to impose some limitation on the use of force. So, okay, so there's a couple of things going on here. I mean, um, it, one is it, the, the, the critique of the idea of this expansive um, America, this imperialist America, was, it came in different forms, it sounds like. It came in the forms of just sort of a dispositional, I mean, I hesitate to say moral, but maybe moral uh, qualms with it, also operational qualms. I mean, it's one thing to say, I don't think we should be an imperialist power. It's another to say, it'd be nice, but I don't think we can pull it off. And there's certain dangers in pursuing that strategy. I mean, I, I imagine all of these were in play. It also sounds like when Pearl ha Harbor happens, there's only one solution on the shelf to deal with Pearl Harbor. And that is full on American, uh, American century. Uh, that right. we're going to be the superpower, as opposed to there could have been other things on that shelf, like limited uh, pushback, um, you know, carving out, you know, we want to just do the hemisphere, but let's do the, the, the three quarter sphere type of thing or something like that. I mean, there were other ways to address that, but it sounds like as that intellectual debate was going on in, in essentially 1940 and half of 41, there was no middle ground that was available to pull off the shelf on December 8th, essentially. That's right. By December 8th, most of uh, the foreign policy establishment at the time had represented the choice like this. Either it was participation or domination of global politics from here on out, or it was isolationism, basically doing nothing, being passive, inert, letting the worst powers run roughshod and that's it. That was the way they portrayed the choice. And indeed, that's the way the choice is often portrayed uh, in our own time. Anybody who, you know, thinks, well, maybe not, maybe let's not have ground troops anymore in Afghanistan or Syria, take your pick. Any kind of reduction, you get the I word 
hurled at you uh, as if you want to do nothing in the world. Right. It became it became very sort of binary. It's interesting, too, because that dynamic. As I'm I'm talking to you about that dynamic and, and you know, hearing the terms uh, New World Order or World Order at that time, I am brought back to PNAC and the project for New American Century, uh, not speaking of the tw 20th, but the 21st, and the idea that, like, we have certain solutions that people have been working on that are sitting on the shelf. 9-11 happens. We pull the one off that we want. And we, this is our opportunity to, to apply it, but, but I, I get ahead of ourselves here. So, um, and, and the, the, the thing that also bummed me out about what you wrote about, frankly, was the UN, uh, because yeah. I, um, you know, I have, I guess, you know, the romantic, uh, notion of the UN that, um, I grew up with and you know, have always accepted and, just the other day I had, I got my son a, a Lego of the, of the UN building and explained to him that this was, was there to prevent war. And now I got to go back and tell him, it, dude, listen, we got to have another talk when you get a little bit, old. he was only seven. So I'm not prepared to tell him the, the reality, but I think we can handle it. What, to, tell us. I think seven-year-olds, first of all, should absolutely buy and read this book on their parents' account. Let me be clear about that. I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> My best. So, yeah, I, I have bad news about the UN. Uh, and this was another finding that surprised me when I did the research. There was also a moment of decision when uh, American post-war planners uh, reached the conclusion, having previously rejected the idea of a new League of Nations, is totally naive. I mean, it was precisely because no universal grouping of nations or no hopes for public opinion to express itself could prevent power politics, uh, that they wanted the United States now to install itself as the dominant military force in the world. So, you know, for the very reason they wanted American global supremacy, they didn't want a universal world organization. Okay. And that's basically the logic through the end of 1941. But then they come to the view that, well, wait a minute, we should rethink this. What's the best way to implement uh, American global dominance, especially if it's in tandem with Great Britain, which a lot of Americans think of as an empire, because it is. Uh, and I talked about you know, how even people like John Foster Dulles found that kind of scheme to be imperialistic. So they worried, you know, would the American public refuse to shoulder the burdens of armed dominance, a role the United States had never played uh, or even seriously put on the table in its debate. And this was the main reason why post-war planners in the State Department in 1942 came to the conclusion, you know, it would be useful to have something. They, they really didn't know what they were exactly envisioning yet, but it'd be useful to have some kind of general world organization with every state a member so that it will look like the United States is um, leading the world in a uniquely enlightened, inclusive, participatory way provided that we're for, uh, still fulfilling our original goals, which are essentially for the United States to have preponderant power and define the way the world goes. It's just so depressing, Steve. <laughs> no, I mean, sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, maybe I, I mean, I'm smiling. But, I'm trying. I know. Well, I, and, and, um, and I, you know, I'm not going to go home and, and, and trash my kids, uh, Lego, uh, building of the UN, uh, quite yet, but it also what it, what it also sort of I guess belies is the awareness of just how undemocratic these elites were being at the time. I mean, it's one thing to say like you know the American public um, they want us to be they want to be the world's you know moral authority or they want to be what however they would tell themselves or whatever it is they want or they want all of the goodies that we're going to get in terms of our American way of life that are associated with this. And, you know, but by having to sort of provide a fig leaf of something that's, you know, markedly different um, suggests to me that they knew what they were doing was 
I guess maybe, you know, like uh, what what we call it Straussian now, I guess, or they knew that they knew that they were, um, you know, we're in charge here and uh, we're just going to feed this to the dupes. How remarkable is it that, you know, when the United States enters the war, it's fighting Japan, it's starting to fight the Nazis, uh, the Soviet Union is uh, fighting for its life. These post-war planners are sitting there in the State Department and they're worried about the American public. And they're they worried, worried about the American public with the presumption that we're going to defeat the Nazis, we're going to defeat ja- the, uh, the Japanese, and we're going to have a supremacy over the Soviet Union. Correct. That is, me, that is, all, that is all correct. If I can just completely a uh, non sequitur here, when I have a conversation with uh, the guy from the Lincoln Project, and he tells me that these political um, uh, these political uh, operatives are not thinking past the election, and they're only thinking about getting rid of Donald Trump, I give you this example right here, where in the midst of a World War II, we've already got people who are strategically in planning out, you know, the world organization that's going to exist following World War II, after you know the the deaths of millions. Um, and uh, how that's going to maintain U.S. hegemony. So I just... Although uh, I, will, I will say this. I wish we had a political class today that was as far-sighted as the people I described. I'm, obviously, I'm critical of what they came up with, uh, you know, less in their own time, given the realities of power that they faced than for where it's left us 80 years later. But that said, I mean, they were making a good faith effort to respond to surprising international events. We're in the midst of of a pandemic where we're experiencing 9-11 scale death of Americans every three days or so. And, you know, that that number could go up uh, as we get into the winter. I'm not seeing a comparable reckoning uh, with the realities of the 21st century world. Uh, So I, I honestly, we'd be improved if if uh, our current uh, crop of experts went back and was just as undemocratic as the experts from World War II, uh, which would be more democratic than they are right now, as well as more responsive to events in the world. Right. Uh, yeah. It, it, we, we went from the frying pan into the fire in terms of like, uh, both in terms of a democracy and frankly, in terms of competence. Uh, in that regard. All right. Well, so let's, um, I, I want to do, I want to, I want to jump ahead to, uh, as you do in your book in some ways, and, and, and bring up that notion of the new world order and of where we are today, because we have all these assumptions about what our role is in the, in the world. We have something, I, I, I don't know what the latest figure is, but somewhere between 700 and 800 bases around the world. It is extraordinary. Our military is larger than the next, something like half a dozen to a dozen countries and all the big ones uh, combined uh, after that. Um, and it gets, you know, I mean, the, the, the greatest critique of that I, we just played, and that was, you know, Joe Buck and Troy Aikman going like, hey, what? why are we doing this flyover for a half full stadium? Like, that seems weird. And, and that's about it. I mean, what, what, why has this not been questioned? And, and just when I was reading, like, it's been 30 years since the fall of the wall. And I'm like, A, I'm old. And B, like, wow, there hasn't been any reckoning at all with this except for the project for a new american century which said u.s needs to be a hyperpower and and correct me if i'm wrong and will maintain all these low-level conflicts around the world so that no one can amass enough power to challenge us why hasn't there been any other sort of debate about this Part of the reason is rooted in the 1990s. I mean, it's actually rooted in what we were just talking about, which is this inherited notion of U.S. global dominance, the idea that the only alternative to dominance is isolationism. Therefore, there's no real choice in the matter. And so when the Soviet Union completely collapsed in 1991, the immediate response of American policymakers was, we, you know, we can't go back to the supposed isolationism of like 1919. Uh, here's a great opportunity to finally fulfill our aspiration of 1945 for one world united under uh, American armed dominance. And so the Pentagon itself lays this all out 
in uh, something called the Defense Planning Guidance. But anyway, there's still some skepticism and talk of a peace dividend coming out uh, of the end of the Cold War in the 1990s. I remember Bill People, Clinton talking about that yeah. in, in the mid 90s, early 90s. And, and George H.W. Bush. So there's actually bipartisan agreement. We should like, you know, be investing in the United States of America. We should also be building peace around the world rather than trying to police it. There's a shift in the late 1990s when uh, PNAC and I must say a humanitarian interventionist uh, on the left or center left uh, uh, ascend. Uh, there's concern about things like uh, the Rwandan genocide, uh, uh, which the US didn't act against. And so also the legacy of Vietnam starts to fade. And the United States finds itself in the 1990s, it did actually um, cut its defense budget as a percentage of GDP. So it had its cake and ate it too. It entered uh, the uh, 2000s uh, in a more enviable, more dominant position uh, than ever while spending less and less. So the idea of costs, and this is also of course the end of history moment, the end of costs go away, even though 9-11 happens, I mean, that's a big cost, uh, kills Americans directly. And then we get into the war on terror. But there is something remarkable. We're, we're in a period of remarkable depoliticization about, uh, about America's role in the world. Certainly that wasn't the case in the 1930s and World War II. There was a whole lot of debate and discussion and mobilization about America's role in the world. I think we are uh, at a different point though. Uh, I think that, you know we express our foreign policy views as a country. We seem to do that in, Democrat, in uh, primary debates. Um, when there's a more meaningful discussion. This time we saw a really interesting debate on the Democratic side, such as it was, it didn't determine the outcome, but it was framed much more around who is going to end endless war than it was around standing up to, you know, the whole crew of adversaries that the United States has. That balance wasn't clear to me coming into the primary, but it's notable that uh, the more anti-war part of the party dominated that discussion. And now Democrats, Democratic voters, including centrists, say that climate change is the number one national security problem that the United States has to deal with. You know, if you take that to its logical conclusion, that's a recipe for significant change. Um, and even on the Republican side, things are changing. I mean, you remember Trump uh, in, in the South Carolina debate in 2016, stand up and blast the Iraq war, and he only gained strength by doing so. So I, I, I do think the, uh, the tectonic plates seem to be shifting right now, but the problem is that we're coming out of a historic period of uh, demobilization um, by the public on foreign policy issues. Um, and part and parcel of that has also been the elites um, thinking that they could just run the show, that the American people didn't care uh, and finding that you know this is indeed not the case. All right. I, I want to take just a quick break. And when we come back, I want to talk about um, in the event that Joe, oh, in the event that Joe Biden wins, I guess in the event that Donald Trump wins, you know, where we go from here and what are the forces that are impacting our foreign policy posture when we have such sort of deep politicization amongst our uh, uh, society? Just a, a quick break and then we'll be right back. Uh, with more with Stephen Wertheim. We are back. I'm talking to Stephen Wertheim. He is the author of Tomorrow the World, The Birth of U.S. Global Supremacy. I know that you did a little bit advising uh, for uh, Bernie Sanders. Well, I, I don't know if it was a little or a lot, but I, but I know that uh, um, uh, you did some advising uh, for Bernie Sanders. Um, uh, and so I want to um, and, 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 and certainly I think Bernie Sanders was outside of immigration, trying to think back now because it feels like it was a million years ago the primary he was um he he emphasized foreign policy more i think than any other candidate in the race I, I, maybe i'm mistaken about that but I, but I, I i seem to remember that which was a big shift for him from 2016 uh frankly and i, I know that was something that he built up over the course of uh of those four years but uh, now we have Joe Biden and Donald Trump. 
Trump wants to take troops out of Afghanistan, as far as I can tell. Uh, and you've got McRaven, you know, I just noticed the other day saying like, you know, that's a problem. Uh, the, the former general who, who was, was, was over there. And um, there, there is a, it, it's a, we have a very weird dynamic right now in terms of like our relationship between our, 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 our political leadership and the military, the national security state, and sort of, you know, we hear a lot about Russia, be, you know, sowing disinformation. And some people think that's going to lead to another Cold War. But then all of a sudden it's going to be China. Like what? We, we, and let me ask you this to, to button that up. If Joe Biden is the president, are we going to get a bunch of Republicans who are going to be his national security apparatus and the State Department? I mean, Democrats have had a problem with this, that they perceive mm -hmm. the Republicans as being daddy. And uh, but are we is there going to be an actual different I mean, different from Republicans and just, you know, sort of like new perspective on foreign policy from the Democrats? Well, those are those are a lot of questions and they're all good ones. And God knows. OK, <laughs> first of all, that the, the sort of cavalcade of, you know, adversaries. Uh, Russia, China, terrorism, everything. This is what happens when a country sets out to be the militarily dominant power in the world, when any kind of prudent uh, retrenchment is cast as isolationism and out of the pale. We get just this constant sense of the world is out to get us, and they are out to get us to some degree. They're at, they are out to push back on the way we assert our power sometimes. That doesn't mean that they you know, are out to get the American people and that the United States can't make uh, better choices, uh, strategic choices that serve the interests of the American people. And I think, you know, this kind of endless war posture we've been on has helped to amplify fears of foreigners and give us, you know, nativist presidents uh, who then turn the war inward on our political system. So that's a meta comment. Now, with respect to the Biden campaign, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. Here's what I am uh, hopeful for. I, when Barack Obama became president, he, I think, defeated Hillary Clinton in 2008 because he had opposed the Iraq war at the time. She had done quite the opposite. Without that, I don't think he becomes the Democratic nominee or becomes the president. And, you know, Obama in his own time was, you know, one of the best voices in the Senate on foreign policy issues. And so I think those who were critical of American war making were deferential toward uh, the Obama administration, especially when the, the hawks were rallying uh, in, on, on Capitol Hill to thwart the good things that Obama did. I am hopeful of this, like regardless of whether uh, a Biden administration um, consists of uh, figures who I would approve of or not, I am hopeful that it will at least have the political savvy to realize where the voters are. And yes, it's progressive voters, it's democratic voters, it's also voters on the right. I mean, everyone seems to acknowledge where voters are on the issues. And then for other reasons, policy gets moved in other directions. So I am hoping, first of all, that the Biden administration, uh, if it happens, genuinely uh, listens to, responds to some of the uh, voices in its own party. And also, and maybe most particularly, that those who are critical of Biden administration policy uh, don't hold back. You know, let them let them have it. Um, right. And that's how we're going to build uh, a a better debate in this country and a better future going forward, regardless of what a Biden administration does. Um, lastly, let me ask you that when you, when when we talk about you know the the various um, I guess. Uh, the, the various incentives that uh, maybe incentive is the wrong word dispositions incentive perspectives that went into creating this the the essentially the regime that we still live in in terms of the foreign policy has that mutated to where it's more uh, self interest on some level like i think I, that's right so no, I, yeah. the the idea of us being you know spreading some you know uh, being responsible neighbors or even like um, you know a missionary style we're the civilized ones we know what everybody wants has sort of been supplanted by 
we've got a lot of oil interest in that area, or we've got a lot of uh, this chemical interest in there, or that mineral interest over there, or geostrategic thing that will protect these shipping lanes for these industrialists. It's, it's basically all, it's all about money now. There was a time when ideas, I think, really mattered. Um, and, you know, my book captures that when there were, you know, strong material interests on both sides of the question. Um, and I think this moment of radical uncertainty, you know, produced new thinking. I think we're different, we're in a different place right now. And how much clearer could it be when you have a president who actually likes taking oil uh, as the justification for a U.S. military mission, as he, as he puts it uh, with respect to Syria? He prefers taking the oil to, you know, some high-minded rhetoric about spreading democracy or something. So, you know, I, I think we're at the point, it's just a remarkable rupture in the way we think about America's role in the world. We're at this point where it's um, implausible that the United States has a plan for peace. Right. Um, you know, Trump says peace through strength. Does anyone think Donald Trump has a plan for peace? So we really have to ask ourselves, like at this point, we're just gonna keep the endless war going. And if so, I invite, people I disagree with to espouse that view openly, cheerlead endless war, go ahead. They're more or less doing that with respect to Afghanistan. Uh, or we have to make a significant, uh, significantly different choice uh, so that the United States can finally have a chance of living at peace, at least make peace normal in its conduct with the world in the 21st century and focus on the uh, transnational and planetary challenges that really matter to the American people and matter to others, climate change, Pandemic diseases have to top that list. Well, uh, Stephen Wertheim, uh, the book is fascinating. Tomorrow, the world, the birth of U.S. global supremacy. I think the uh, lesson, it's clear for us in this uh, day and age that um, we need to deal with the powerful in this country to deal with how we project ourselves in the rest of the world. Stephen Wertheim, thanks so much for your time today. We'll put a link at uh, majority.fm. Terrific. Thank you. All right, folks. That is it uh, for our first hour of the program today. Tomorrow on the program, we'll have Brian Fallon. He is the executive director of Demand Justice. And um, one of the things that came out of a Supreme Court uh, uh, ruling on the Pennsylvania court is that we may have some big, big problems if uh, this election ends up in the Supreme Court. But we will talk about that tomorrow. Uh, for those of you sticking around for the rest of the program, for the fun half that's coming up and for even like the we are, this is sort of like a this is sort of the interregnum is that what we would call that matt and brendan like the, the this, interregnum the interregnum this little uh time between the first hour where the show goes to the uh, cho uh the peacock app and before we're in the fun half we're in sort of like a like a purgatory is that, yeah, there, there's no real that probably rules. Not it's probably just a series of norms. Right. That we abide by. The purgatory, uh, purgatory is probably not what we should call it, right? That isn't, that's not a great branding tool. The purgatory interregnum. <laughs> it does sound like something I would. You should get Benjamin to do a, uh, a voiceover. Now for that. the purgatory interregnum. Um, this is the uh, time of the program where I tell you you can support the show by becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. It's your support that makes the show possible. Uh, if you're one of those people who don't have the resources right now, uh, but you want the extra content, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. Actually, probably wait till after the election because the next 10 days, 14 days are sort of nuts. Um, and... It's usually better for me to do like, you know, on, on, on days when I don't have the children too, but uh, you don't know my schedule. So uh, wait till after the election and we'll get to you, but send us an email at majority reporters at gmail.com and we will hook you up. Um, also don't forget the AM quickie every morning. You can get seven minutes of headlines. We're getting it out the door so early now. It's like, uh, like 7 AM, 7 30. It'll be um, in your podcast serving app or whatever you do, or you can just get the Majority Report app at majorityapp.com. It's completely free and it'll show up there as well, as well as the shows. And as well as if you're a member, you can search, et cetera, et cetera. And don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off the major uh, off any of the coffees, including the Majority Report blend. They are a co-op from Madison, Wisconsin. Great folks. Um, 
know me. Hi, as I knock over my microphone. <laughs> you gotta get, your, your mic sounds, you gotta get a little bit closer. We gotta do something about that. Like, like I'm not a professional like you. You know what it is? Know. Honestly, I think you need to hang something from your ceiling. I do. I have everything around me. I don't want to like break it down and show you. I can't figure it out. And it's like, I got a good microphone. I don't know. I think I'm... that microphone might be omnidirectional. Maybe you need a unidirectional mic. Uh-huh. I, I just made that up. I don't even know. <laughs> okay. I was like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> no, Brendan says you sound good. It's also could be the Zoom. I get it from the Zoom. So maybe you got sound it, it. even better than me. Thank you, Brendan, for having my back because I put a lot of work into this. I even have a pillow around it and foam and... You know, and you can't even see it on camera. Pillow and foam. That's good. That's that's smart play. I have this thing. I don't know how to put it together, but it's for an popper? extra thing. You don't thing. need that. I don't think I do either. You don't I was need told that. that. You don't people pop. call it a popper. Yeah, people call it a popper, I think. <laughs> that's you pop funny. the peas and you sear sizz. Yeah, no, you don't have that problem. I once got yelled at um, when I was starting at Sirius XM. Uh, they took me in for a meeting to address my S's. It was like a whole team meeting about you have to work on your S's. They're too s z Hmm. Yeah. That's how, how what you call corporate doing culture. It? How did you go about doing that? I don't know. I just stopped. <laughs> I was more conscious of it. And then they stopped yelling at me because I, I, I couldn't change it. If I worked at Sirius, they would they would have fired me immediately because of my ahs and my ums. I, it wasn't serious. It was Ron Hartenbaum and his partner. Let's just be very clear. Who oh, I know you know. Okay. Yeah. Eesh. Yep. Yep. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what that guy's got to work on. A lot of different things. Anyways, um, what's happening on the Nomiki show? The, I'm sorry, the what show? The Nomiki <laughs> show. Just kidding. Uh, today we have Derek Black. He is the author of Schoolhouse Burning, Public Education, and the Assault on American Democracy. Uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, how public school system is just being devastated. And if we have four more years of Trump, let me tell you, uh, Betsy DeVos will have her way. And I actually think this is a great place where we can pressure Biden, who came out of the Obama administration, very pro-charter school, to actually invest more. And it's just gone too far. So if progressives are looking for a space where they're like, well, Biden's not going to be different at all. He actually might be different from the Obama administration on education. It's just gone way too far. Um, there was stuff that came out of the, um, uh, the, the committees that they did with Sanders. Mm -hmm. My sense is, is that their disposition towards education is going to be very different from the Obama administration. And in part, I know that like the teachers unions, yes. uh, got in there early to make sure that that wasn't the, they didn't want to be caught in the same way that they were with the Obama administration. And in part, right. that was at least what I heard was the explanation as to why they, endorsed Clinton so early right. in that race in 2016 is that they felt they had dropped the ball with the Obama administration and it led all those sort of like a uh, pro reform, so-called pro reform uh, education people, you know, basically business types uh, yeah. in there. Uh, but I, 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 I feel like, I, I feel like that's an area where they're going to be better certainly than the Obama administration was. I mean, frankly, that's a low bar. It's a low bar, but there's also a tremendous amount of financial leverage too. the largest givers to the Democratic Party of the teachers, teachers unions. And so, you know, it, you're seeing it on the ballot in multiple states uh, to put more money into ed. I mean, there's a real movement on the ground in states where it's very hard to organize as, as we're seeing, you know, in West Virginia, Arizona, we've seen this was going on. I just don't think even politically they can they can move away or sneak something in to be even like a an Arnie Duncan light. It's just, it's just not doable. Right. And so. then when you see all of the, um, uh, the, the red state revolt and there's a, in fact, there is also, uh, I, I had today payday report was reporting on, uh, another teacher strike. I feel like it might've been in Ohio, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, and I, I will check that out and we'll talk about that tomorrow or the next day. But, but part of it is also, you know, uh, COVID has, I think, strengthened and made teachers even more aware of how important it is to have a union because there are mm -hmm. times where they're like, you know, your bosses are going to try and exploit you and they don't care <laughs> about you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that's at uh, 3 p.m. Where can people find that? At uh, youtube.com slash the Nomi Key Show. And if you want to listen to an the audio, the Nomi Key Show. Yes, the Nomi Key Show. Okay. Nomi Key. Nomi Key Show. Okay. Right there on the screen for you. I don't know if you can see it. Um, 
Oh, he's looking. That's it. And okay. we're also, I, I want to give a shout out because we have two more guests. We have Giovanni Al- Alcibia, who is a DACA advocate uh, and Napoleon to legend. Uh, Giovanni went viral last week because he was saying, you know, listen, I'm at risk of not being in this country if we don't have Biden elected and he doesn't support Biden. He's been, you know, very vocal about his, his support of Sanders, but he gave a very, um, the plea was, was, it was, it was, you know, you want to have these theoretical arguments like we had last week. Well, here's a material effect right there. He will be out of the country. So. Um, All right. And uh, don't forget, folks, you can check out the Antifada at patreon.com slash the Antifada. Jamie's got a bunch of new programming up there. Matt, what is happening tonight on TMBS? <clears throat> Joshua Khan Russell joins us. We're going to talk about the Bolivian elections and also the Mi'kmaq uh, Native Americans up in Nova Scotia. Or Na- sorry, indigenous folks up in uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, they're b- basically, there's a, a conflict going on with commercial fishermen up there upset that they're fishing in the area and they're like destroying property it's really crazy so we're going to talk about that a little bit too but uh, mainly bolivia tonight with joshua con russell all right awesome. folks check that out it i'm getting an im saying it's gahana in ohio the gahana jefferson school district they went on strike uh um and then maybe they're they're still on strike right now <clears throat> all right we're going to take a uh, quick break head into the fun half as it were what else i feel like i am like i'm forgetting something like, I feel like I'm leaving the house without my keys or something. <laughs> All right, see you in the fun half. <laughs> Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five eighths, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice. Today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're not paying. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. (laughs) What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. You guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way. Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Damn, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, 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 I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Oh, God. Um, You know, I, I'm so torn, Nomi, because I want to laugh 
at um, the, the sort of the panic a little bit about Donald Trump right now and um, which specific panic? Well, I mean, I think there's a little bit of panic. I mean, I think like the only time that Donald Trump is honestly like feels good mm-hmm. is when he's in front of the audience. Yeah. And I do mean audience like, and he's out there and he's, you know, just riffing. And like, I think he really likes that. And I think it's, I think, you know, we're going to have this, that is going to exist until he drops dead or goes to jail. Yep. And then if it's in jail, we're going to get like, it's going to be like Johnny Cash, like at Folsom prison type of type of thing. Right. Like, you know, he's going to. At the he'll, Hague, he'll be like. <laughs> he'll just, he'll be, he'll be, you know, like doing shows for people in the, and then I don't know, but, um, but I do think he's getting a little panicked because, and look, I don't know the, um, you know, it's impossible for us to know the uh if there is even anything at all beyond uh hunter biden in some like compromising photos i my sense is there isn't it's not like they haven't had the government resources to dig into this there's no doubt there's a certain amount of nepotism or not even a certain amount like whatever the full amount of nepotism you can have that there's that amount of nepotism uh and abuse of of joe biden's name by his son or, you know, taking advantage of it. I don't know how you express that. It's rampant in our society. I mean, mm-hmm. th- that's just the reality. Um, you know, look at, the, look at uh, what's her face McCain on The View. I mean, the reason why she is a celebrity is because of John McCain. Abby Huntsman. Abby uh, Huntsman. McCain. And uh, Chelsea yeah. Clinton had a job on NBC. I mean, we talk about this. Yeah. Those are just the ones that come to Peter the Brzezinski. Line. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's honestly, just do a show on this. <laughs> right. I mean, honestly, you could just keep going and going. Um, and and then, you know, you know, Billy Carter going back to Billy Carter mm-hmm. was a problem for Jimmy Carter. Uh, Giuliani's yeah. son worked for Trump, too, I believe. Yeah. Like the ambassador oh. to like sports or some shit. Absolutely. Wait, who did? Uh, Giuliani's son. I oh, mean, Giuliani's son, yeah. It just goes on and on and on. I mean, it, that's that's what this whole world, uh, you know, is. It's just more problematic when we're talking about. A, a public servant, right? Uh, but here is Donald Trump. He is very, very pissed that the people around him haven't been able, the Durham uh, report fizzled out that investigation, at least as an electoral strategy. I mean, maybe it'll go on. They'll find there were abuses on the FISA process. Good, I hope so, because I've always had a problem with the FISA process. Um, the Senate Intel report on, uh, on Hunter Biden fell apart. The, every investigation that they had that they were going to release here was fell apart down to the point where it's like Rudy Giuliani has got to like show photocopies to one unnamed writer at the New York post essentially is really what it comes down to. And even Fox news apparently was nervous about running this story. And so here is Donald Trump. Uh, on with Will Kane filling in on Fox and Friends. Will Kane was Superman, I think, right? In like a, some version, some iteration or small villain. Uh, Dean that's Kane. Dean Kane. Oh, Dean Kane. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, then. Oh, Will Kane. No, Will Kane. I know that guy too. He was um, one of those like sort of, well, a place. He's like, well, just a right wing tar. <laughs> Clinton had his issues. I remember Billy Carter's, uh, Billy Carter with Jimmy Carter's his issues. But I think this issue, what makes it relevant, is what Joe Biden had to do with this. What question do you have for Joe Biden in the debate? So people don't think it's a family issue. Uh, it's more about the vice presidential issue, some would say. How do you plan on par- uh, parrying that uh, issue? Well, this is far bigger than Jimmy Carter. I mean, this is a, a, an issue that's, I mean, his son walked around like a vacuum cleaner. But they say right in, look, this is the laptop from hell. They say right in the laptop that, you know, the big man has to get 10 percent. And then in another case, they say 50 percent. This is 100 percent. This is, and even if he didn't get, and he does get, and he lives like a king, even if he didn't get 
all of this money, and everybody's known this in Washington for a long time. This isn't surprising. Nobody's surprised by this. But even if he didn't, you can't go to China and have the sun walk out with one and a half billion dollars to manage. You can't go to Ukraine and have him get $183,000 a month with a $3 million upfront payment. You can't get three and a half million dollars from the mayor of Moscow's wife. Three and a half million dollars. And you have no experience. You didn't have a job until your father became vice president. It, it's disgraceful. What if he says, happening. I don't know anything about and media, this? And the media can't cover it. The media refuses Mr. to cover it. Mr. It president, what if he just says, I, I don't know anything about Oh, God. Right? <laughs> Wait, so, so let's just start with the obvious. Joe Biden, as, as sketchy as this is, and, and this is obviously the way Washington works, Joe Biden was not president at the time, number one which we've all talked about. And number two, I just think this is a game to neutralize any sort of attacks against Trump and his circle of family and friends that are literally in the White House right now. I don't know if anybody's going to attack at, at this point, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's neutralizing. I mean, I, I see I, it on Facebook, frankly. Like, there are folks being like, oh, well, he's just as corrupt. That's, that's what they're trying to do. It's from the normies, to, from the normies. Yes, These are, they're not trying to, they're not trying to necessarily neutralize. Well, they're trying to make it, they're trying to create parity. Yes. That it is like, yeah. Uh, and this is what they did with, with, with Clinton too. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The idea is that they don't want, they're, they're just looking to suppress votes. They're just looking for people to say, oh, so corrupt. No difference between the two of them. Doesn't matter if I vote. That, that is, it's completely a play to depress turnout. Exactly. The problem is, is that if you're going to do this, I, I mean, this the, the problem for Trump, okay? And this is like just putting on like just pure political analysis. It worked with Clinton because there had been like a 25-year project to sort of create this narrative Whitewater, Travelgate. Um, I mean, it goes on and Rose on. Rose Law I mean, Firm. They had, yeah, Rose Law Firm. And they had, like, you know, like, they're, they're, you know, they didn't Impeachment. Need <laughs> impeachment. But also, like, Hillary Clinton uh, killed Vincent Foster. You know, Vince Foster. I mean, there was so much sort of, like, ground already tilled, as it were, mm -hmm. that you didn't have to put the, just to really, uh, you know, overdo this metaphor. You didn't have to, like, put a pick in there and, and, and loosen the soil, you know, with, with Hillary Clinton, it's like the, 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 the soil was ready. All you needed to do was plant the seed. You didn't just drop it right in with Joe Biden. Like there's no pre-existing notion. The guy's whole narrative has been, I'm just a regular guy. I take the, I take the train a lot. That was, that's basically it. That and that he was a lap dog for the banks. But I mean, in a lap dog in, in like like a, a way that just sounded like he was like he was dominated, but he wasn't necessarily capitalizing on it. There's just no narrative of him being that way. But that's not even his narrative. I mean, that's his narrative on the left. That's his narrative on, you know, in the last couple of years during the, the primaries. But it really hasn't been the mainstream narrative. I mean, if you were to a ask the average viewer who's who's watching you know, these shows don't remember him when he was senator from from uh, they just remember him. Exactly. As right. Yes. But even no, then, they're not aware. I mean, people I associate Wall Street Chuck. Sure. But not, you know, agree credit card totally. Joe. Agree totally. Even on the left. And but that's who he's that's who Trump is trying to get. at, exactly. Right. I mean, because it's going to be the left that's most sensitive to these type of um, to these type of, of charges. But the, the problem is, is like you're still cutting against the narrative mm -hmm. and there's no evidence like. I'm not even clear on what, you know, I had a vague notion of what the charges of, of, of Clinton were that they were using their charity uh, in some way. They were, they were raising money for their charity based upon supposed favors that they were going to give when she was secretary of state or something to that effect, which is also sort of like a bank shot. Like, wait a second, they're raising money for a charity to do like, I mean, Putting aside, I want to litigate all that stuff. But what the charge? Well, a little here, bit worse than that. The, the anyway. charge here is that um, Joe Biden is getting kickbacks from his son using. Like, I'm not even clear what it is. But he wasn't. I mean, that's that's the point. It's like they need to find. There's there's no line there. What are they going to do? Some massive investigation in the next two weeks. Also, 
even if he were, he was a private citizen at that time. So he could even, let's just go with that argument. Oh yeah, he was making something. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And by the way, he's disclosed his financials. So clearly he wasn't unless he was right. hiding it somewhere. And like, and that's what they're doing that a whole house. I mean, there's this, this smear effort showing his house in Delaware that he sold like 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Yeah, or something. I, I looked into that. It's a massive house. It is. And apparently he bought it in 1972 for yeah. about $160,000, which in today's dollars is about 600,000, I think. And he was a senator at that time. So he was making about $45,000 a year. So, you know, you buy a house that's three times your annual salary uh, with a 30 year mortgage. I mean, that's not, that's, that's, that, that's run of the mill, I think. And his wife worked at the time. And his wife worked too. And, and so, I mean, that's not, that's, you know, but that house is, I can't believe the houses you could get at that time for. I think what's so, I know, right? I think what's so, so odd about these arguments coming from Trump of all people, this bedazzled like character is it's, it's inauthentic. And I, I, I don't know if it's going to work, but it just seems like they're throwing everything against the wall, like you said, to depress the vote. And that's it. But here's the, here's the funny part is that they're not throwing everything. It, it is almost as if Donald Trump is a one trick pony and we didn't recognize that because that one trick worked so well in 2016. Now we're going to find out. I mean, there's a lot of other tricks that are going on that aren't necessarily Donald Trump, right? There's a, there's a tremendous, the, the number of, of means in which the Republicans are disenfranchising voters in addition to COVID creates a whole nother, you know, sort of potential perfect storm, but they're just running the same play that they did with Clinton, right? The just straight out corruption play, but, but it's just a much tougher play to run. Like, I don't know, you know, he tried sleepy Joe that didn't work either because then, you know, the problem is that Joe showed up and he was just as coherent as Trump was. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, more or less. And so I, I, I think it's just very, very difficult. So what play would it have been? I mean, what this signals to me is that he doesn't have, have the, the, the Bannons in the world of the world in the room. It just doesn't seem. I mean, Bannon was all about China. It's like they latched on to China, but then they never fully carried out the China strategy because his strategists are indicted in jail, in trouble, can't be associated with him, can't be close to him. And now it's just Trump and like his like 12th, uh, 12th lineup of, of campaign manager. Who I don't even know his campaign manager is at this point because he's <laughs> right. It's Stepien, although I think Stepien, I don't know what Stepien's. Um, uh... COVID situations, apparently Melania Trump has canceled her campaign appearance because she has a lingering cough. Trump um, didn't sound so good either. Yeah, he now. did not. Yes. Uh, hopes and prayers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the, I mean, part of what maybe is just missing is that they really need Joe Biden to not be an old white guy. That may have helped. Oh, you mean, you mean uh, Trump needed Biden to not be an old white guy from like the Rust Belt-ish yeah. Well, that was the whole, listen, say what you will about these neoliberals uh, not running a campaign and God forbid something bad happens and it could have helped to have them on the trail. It could have helped having, I don't know, field offices set up so people could get signs earlier. I mean, these are the complaints that are happening at the local level. You know, they could still hide Joe Biden and still have an operational campaign, but that was the whole thing. You know, how do we win over the, the misogynist uh, Rust Belt voters that once voted for a Democrat? Uh, let's talk a little bit about the debate, which it appears now, as of now, is taking place Thursday night, mm -hmm. uh, despite the fact that Donald Trump, um, they will have the ability to mute his microphone. Now, this is going to be in person, right? It's going to be an in-person uh, debate. Is that right, Brendan? Do we know the details of it? Um, in person, yeah. In person, but there will be a microphone muter. Now, I, I wouldn't put it past like Trump to like show up with like a megaphone or something like that, <laughs> whip it out. Um, but mm -hmm. here is, he's being asked on uh, Fox and friends again, uh, Will Kane, not, uh, Dean yep, Kane. not Dean Kane. No, Will Kane. I know he, he was, uh, I, I worked with him a little bit on C at CNN, not worked with him, but against him. <laughs> wait, so wait, hang on a second. Is Steve Ducey off? Cause he got in trouble for not, taking trump seriously he seems he sounded bad yesterday sick. the other oh, day i mean 
He's like, listen, guys, COVID, we have to take it seriously. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe. Uh, here is uh, Donald Trump on uh, Fox and Friends talking about what he's going to unleash on Joe Biden. So in this debate this week, what do you think is the starkest contrast, the number one issue voters need to consider that's different between you and Joe Biden? We've had a lot of different issues come up, law and order, the economy, COVID, shutdowns. But what's the number one stark contrast in your mind between you and Joe Biden? Okay, so many individual things, whether it's Second Amendment or uh, energy or all of these things, they want to raise your taxes, I want to lower your taxes, regulations, all of that. But the bottom line, the American dream, the great American dream versus being a socialist hellhole. Because they're going to turn us into a socialist nation. We're going to be no different than Venezuela. And I'll tell you what, it can happen. It can happen. Venezuela 20 years ago was unbelievable. And now they don't have water. They don't have food. They don't have medicine. The only difference is we'd be much bigger. But that's what it is. It's the American dream versus a socialist hellhole. <laughs> they don't even buy it. They're like, mm. that one didn't <laughs> land as well. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, maybe you should work on that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is that, um, you know, Joe Biden, to the extent that he did anything, was kept saying over and over again, I'm not a socialist. I'm not I, that. I mean, that is they 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 anticipated this attack and guarded against it. I don't know. This is not to say that it would have made a difference to, um, you know, against anybody. But the, the Biden campaign of all the campaigns was pretty scrupulous about this. Uh, they were they were determined to not let Donald Trump say Venezuela socialist hellhole. And this is like, but think about this. What number is this of strategy? Right now we're at Sleepy Joe. We're at corrupt guy. We're at. Um, what, like he has a problem with like, what, stutter. This three, a four, yeah, four. Like he's, stutter, like he's dying stutter, or something. They've like thrown a bunch of weird Sleepy stuff Joe. Out. That seems all like a, a part of a whole that they've abandoned. I mean, they haven't been able to stick to a single theme throughout this. Now it's self shows hell hole. I don't think that's going to work. But he's also let's go to uh, number uh, number two. Uh, this is what he also plans to bring up at the debate, and everybody uh, wants to hear about this. We played number two. We did? No, we didn't. Oh, oh, that was it. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. I forgot the uh, laptop hellhole. Um, we, can play, we can play the uh, number details four. of this hellhole. Yeah. It's just, yes, yeah, number four. Here's, here's the details of that <laughs> socialist hellhole. And what specifically would you point to with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris that would take us to that socialist hellhole? Well, everything, you know, socialized medicine. They want you to go to a hospital if you have a cold, take away your health care. They want to take away 180 million incredible health care plans that that people love. What? Listen, just in case you were wondering what a socialist hellhole looks like, you get a cold, you go to the hospital. And then we take away your health care. So I don't know how you get to the hospital without any health care. That's in these socialist hellholes. When you're sick, you get to go to a hospital. But also, like, that's how off-brand he is right now. Everyone's thinking, am I better today than I was four years ago, right? That's that's sort of like the, the thought process for maybe, hopefully, an undecided voter if there is one. And yet he's leading with medical care out of all the things to talk about right now. Shut your mouth, Trump. Like, that's what his advisors are saying. Don't remind Don't people. people. Right. Yes. Don't remind people that right now you get a cold. People do want to go to the hospital. <laughs> well, this is also... The the reason this was also the theory as to why him deploying social socialist hellhole would not have made a difference against a Sanders or even to some extent a Warren, because he doesn't have the ability to articulate policy. So when they get to the next question, when friendly Will Kane says, "Can you be a little more specific?" Like you say, socialist hellhole. What does that look like? And then he's like, oh, I didn't know that was going to be on the test. Go back to the beginning and play this again. 
And what specifically would you point to with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris that would take us to that socialist hellhole? Well, everything, you know, socialized medicine. They want you to go to a hospital if you have a cold, take away your health care. They want to take away 180 million incredible health care plans that people love, that people love. I mean, you can go down a list forever. They want to take away your guns. They want to take away, they want to defund your police or at least radically change your police. Look what they're doing in Minneapolis. Look what they're doing in Seattle. They want to destroy your police forces and at the, at the same time, take away your guns. So you can't protect yourself. So I understand Melania is going to join. Hmm. Yeah, maybe we should just change the subject. That was basically a socialist hellhole. Take away your guns. I mean, do you think that the the, the hosts are? I, it does seem like they're abruptly switching. Like they're not buying it. I'm I'm very confused by what's going on at Fox News when they're responding to Trump's strategies on I, Fox and Friends. Specifically. I think I think everybody there is a little bit of a quality of like how do we start to edge away a little bit from this? I, I yeah, mean, I, the Ben I, Sass, that yes, they, they did it in 2016 too, if you recall. Yeah. Yep. I mean, they were really, they were ready to reposition. Now Murdoch's gone, James Murdoch's gone, but they were ready to reposition to like the, the Megyn Kelly land and talk about, you know, global, global warming in their perspective. Yep. Remember those articles? Yep, yep. I think so. And, you know, even having like a guy like Will Kane on, he is not of that ilk in, in the past. I mean, he dabbles. He's a businessman, but, um, uh, <laughs> He's a businessman. You know, I mean, that's a lot of these people are, but uh, there it is. Socialist hellhole. Just in case you were wondering, a lot of people call in, what's the definition of socialism? It is you get sick, you go to the hospital and also uh, change police and <laughs> take away your guns. That's it. That's it. That's Definitely. all it takes. So you can defend yourself from the socialist hellhole. There you go. Well, that's also, that's what happens when we have a social hell hole. Hell hole. Um, all right. So the other interesting thing that's going on now, and um, we're getting all our information from Trump. And it's like, it, that's the thing about watching Fox and Friends. It's like Trump's um, like id just is like projected on a screen, essentially. And so, <laughs> um, and this is right now, we are 24 hours approximately, maybe less now. Uh, for Nancy Pelosi's um, deadline for when the White House has to have a plan that they can agree on so that it can be passed through the House. I have a feeling that deadline's a little bit squishy, but it is to, you know, it was a, it was a marker that, that is down there. Um, it's unclear what Mitch McConnell's going to do. He's claiming that he will put this to a vote if the White House agrees to a deal. Um, and... Pelosi is starting to make some sounds that make it seem like she and Mnuchin are getting close, right? That they're starting to talk about, like it's everything is being talked about sort of like sideways, but you're starting to hear stuff uh, being reported, like maybe they're getting close on the COVID treatment. Maybe they're getting close on, on uh, state and city uh, funding. I mean, remember from the perspective of, of, of wanting to get aid to people, um, I think it's a pretty good bet that something's going to happen either in the lame duck or, and I've already got a piece, they're already planning the reconciliation bill if, if, if Joe Biden gets elected. If Joe Biden gets elected, you got something happening basically the, the first week of February. If Donald Trump gets elected, you get something right after the election. So if you're Nancy Pelosi, you can send some stuff right now. You're just afraid that, that it's going to get Donald Trump elected. I just don't see, I, I don't know. I I mean, unless I'm someone receives a check with his signature, I don't think it's going to influence the election. We're two no. weeks out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of those, we already have more people voting already in Texas than voted for Trump, period, in 2016. Right. In Texas. So, because remember, it's not about swaying people to move to Trump, it's about keeping people home. Yep. That's what this is about. There are not enough voters in the voter universe that are going to move to Trump. This well, is the only play. The only difference, the only thing that we've seen, though, is that there has been an uptick in Republican registration in some um, some battleground states. It has not been, you know, sort of talked about that much. It's very hard to put into your models as to what these people are going to do, who they are, who they're replacing. Um, I would imagine, on the flip side, 
relative to 2016, if you look at Trump voters and you look at Clinton voters, I would have to bet, and I haven't seen data to this effect, uh, but I would bet that the number of Trump voters relative to like attrition is smaller. In other words, you had an older cohort who voted for Trump, they're more likely to die. Yeah. And that they have sort of bottomed out. And even if so, even if there wasn't any I new see, yeah. voters, I think the dynamic would be the the number of people who would have voted for Hillary Clinton is higher than it would have been with, with Trump. But again, it's just a question of where these votes come. Here is Donald Trump talking about the state of play for a coronavirus relief bill. The one person in Washington who definitively doesn't want this is Mitch McConnell. He doesn't want this because this is going to be problematic for him either way. Pelosi's nervous about Trump getting too much credit for it. Because remember, right. whenever they sign something, what happens is Donald Trump has a big signing statement and doesn't let her come in into the room. So there's no images of her coming out doing this. But um, here is uh, Trump revealing that he wants to do something even better than Pelosi. Could you bring us into the play-by-play -play of the rescue package? It's been 91 days since any type of rescue package uh, came from uh, Congress that you have signed. And we know the American people are hurting. It's been so long. If you're in the hospitality yeah. industry, which you're very familiar with, been devastated. If you're a waiter or an actor, you've been destroyed. So now we understand that Steve Mnuchin, your Secretary of Treasury, and these asking a very legitimate question. So kudos to you, Kill Me. But it's also, hang on, it is also a gift to Trump to also acknowledge the human pain and suffering of folks. They're actually giving, yes, if you're, if you're, I, no, I agree. It's, yeah. Yeah, you got to. Don't forget, you're the president and there are people hurting. I'm going to right. remind you in the premise so that people think you actually considered that before you started talking. Exactly. As today, what could you tell us? Because Mitch McConnell isn't exactly on board with those negotiations. Well, he'll be on board if something comes. But, but let me just explain that it's very simple. I want to do it even bigger than the Democrats. Now, not every Republican agrees with me, but they will. But I want to do it even bigger than the Democrats, because this is money going to people that did not deserve what happened to them coming out of China. Now, to just put it very simply, we want to do it, but do it. we'll see whether or not she changes her mind. But we want to do it because people need help and they should get help. Well, she's even at 2.4. Very strongly coming back. Mr. President, she's at 2.4 trillion and you want to go bigger than that? John well, Thune she's says two point, she's at 2.2 okay. and I would like to go I would be willing to go more because I think that number one I view it differently. We get the money back the government. It gets the money back ultimately anyway. And it's better than unemployment and it's better than all of the other costs associated with the alternative. So I want to go I would rather go a bigger than that number, but we'll see. But here's the problem. She doesn't want to do anything until after the election because she thinks that helps her. I actually think it helps us because everyone knows that she's the one that's breaking up the deal. Now, they are talking. Let's see what happens. But I would rather go bigger than her number. Senator Thune says he doesn't want to even go close to $2 trillion. Would you pass well, this we'll with mostly Democratic votes? Thune. Would you pass it with mostly Democratic votes? I'd take all the votes you could get, whether it's Democrat or Republican. Okay. I mean, this is, this is really, really fascinating, I think, because I think he's, he's, I think he's right. I think Pelosi is afraid of passing something before the election for, because of the election. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's, I, I mean, I, I find that highly like, I don't want to say immoral, but I, I, I mean, uh, immoral on some level. But that's also, I mean, if we were in a normal election where everybody was turning out and voting on election day, that would be great, a, a great ad in itself. Pelosi is afraid to pass this because she doesn't want us to get a win. So either way, she's stuck. She's she's bound to to do one or the other, give them a win or appear as if she is completely inhumane. And if they had a better package, they should have brought it up. But here's the thing. But but here's the thing. Well, I mean, who the the Democrats? Democrats, yeah. Well, they did. They had a they had they had the Heroes Act was the was uh, almost twice. I mean, look, you and more I, than yeah. From our perspective, you know, we don't like the the Cobra stuff, but there's a lot of stuff in there that's good. Um, 
But here's the thing, like, all right, put aside the idea and, and I, it's, we're speculating. I don't know if Nancy Pelosi doesn't want to pass it just, just because uh, she doesn't want uh, Trump to get credit. She wants to also protect her chair people and make sure that they're getting what they want because she wants to maintain her power in the event that Biden wins. I mean, that's also part of this. It's not just as necessarily a fear of, of Trump. What do you mean? Okay. So they had a $2.2 trillion package, right? That represents the interests of all her party, uh, of all her committee chairs. I want this much for, I'm in health and human services committee. I want this uh, for, for hospitals. Uh, I'm in education. I want this for schools, whatever it is, all worthy stuff. They went from 3.8 trillion to 2.2 trillion and, it, and they didn't change the distribution of those monies. They didn't say, we're not going to do this silo. They put the uh, timelines shorter so that every silo gets what they wanted. And this, and I may say, this is, this is David Dayen's theory, and, and I subscribe to it. She needs to go in and protect the interest of those various committee chairs, because they are not just committee chairs. They are nodes of influence within the party for her to maintain her speakership, right? If the the Democrats win, or her leadership, if they lose, she needs all those people. She right. cannot stab one or two of them in the back by saying that, okay, we're going to pass something, but your what you need to help your reelection or to help the people on your to build your power base, we're going to cut that out. Sorry, we had to make a deal, so you get left out. No, everybody's got to be included in there mm -hmm. to make this deal. Otherwise she loses her ability to maintain power in her caucus and get reelected. I mean, this is the game that they're playing. And if you guys don't think this is the case, I don't know what to tell you. This is what politicians do. The, they call it the iron law of institutions. It's not just politicians. I mean, if you work in a big corporation, you can see the same thing. People are not like, the, you know, Acme uh, Widgets needs to succeed. It's like, I need to succeed. And if that means the Acme widgets doesn't necessarily hit their, you know, maximize their potential as a company, whatever, as long as I keep getting paid. And so, I mean, that's the way that these people operate. And so Donald Trump is saying, and, and it, part of it, maybe she's also afraid that there, that, that it will help Donald Trump. But if Trump is out there saying that I want to do more than $2.2 .2 trillion, what Nancy Pelosi should be saying is, we got a three point eight trillion right. dollar bill. It's already passed. It's sitting right here. Exactly. I, I and she should go out there and say, I am perfectly willing. If Donald Trump comes in with anything over two point two trillion dollars, and it's legitimately spending that, we'll pass it in the House. Because then what happens is they've got to pass this in the Senate. Right. That's, that's what I'm saying. I don't understand why she's not doing this. Why is she just sitting? Well, it's I think she's afraid that Mitch McConnell will pass a one point eight trillion dollar bill. I'm afraid. Why can't she bring up her three point the, the heroes? Why can't well, that's, that's the thing? Is it's like it doesn't really exist? Challenge anymore. Trump yeah. to do a bigger bill because if the bill passes in the Senate with more Democratic votes right. than, than Republican. Um, and again, you know, at that point, the only concern is does this help Donald Trump win that he's reaching across the aisle? I mean, Democrats would get um theoretically would get the uh, the credit for it because they they needed to provide the majorities in both houses. Right. But I think they're afraid, like, will it look like he's reaching across the aisle? But I'm sorry, like. The ship's passed. That ship's passed. We're two weeks out. Yeah. Even if they flip this, they turn this thing around, like all it would do is inhibit um, the, the ability to get uh, Coney Barrett maybe uh, confirmed. And there's so many stories going on, COVID. I just think that like, that fear is overblown and you could seriously hurt the Republicans in the Senate. I mean, it's one thing to, for Donald Trump to win the election because he's, you know, reaching across the aisle, right? It's another thing if, um, you know, uh, uh, Gideon can say, or, well, Susan Collins would probably vote for it, but uh, Joni Ernst wouldn't. Right. Tom Tillis wouldn't. Uh, you know, maybe Cory Cory Gardner would, but uh, Martha McSally won't. No, I mean, there's going to be you could. What's Purdue going to do, right? Like or Loeffler? I mean, 
you're going to be able to hammer these people in these Senate races, hammer them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Either they're going to capitulate or they're not. I mean, it there's is no time. There's, I mean, hammer them with what? Like in, in, in a, if they vote against this four days out from an election and you're in Georgia, it'll make I'm a sorry, difference. You're that right. can make it, a difference. That's, that's it, it won't necessarily with the, with the, uh, the general, but you know, the people who are not voting, I, I have no data on this, but I'm going to bet that the majority of those people who have voted in Texas are voting Democrat. Mm -hmm. the and here's the thing, there's so much money being flooded, like like getting into the, the nuance of this, so much money being flooded into these Senate races. It's almost like they could just print mailers out two different forms and send whichever one ends yes. up. You know what I mean? There's yes. so much extra yes. money. And there, I mean, this is a weird thing that's happening in these races. Like, we don't know what to do with the money now. It's like coming in too much, too fast at the end. And, you know, it takes like a mailer, like a week to, you know, it takes time. Right, right. I mean, Jamie Harrison, can you imagine what Jamie Harrison could do if Lindsey Graham That's voted right. for or against? Because if he votes for, Jamie Harrison's out there going like, you shouldn't vote for this third party uh, conservative guy because he would have voted against this with, yeah. you know, with uh, with the Republican values. That's why you should never have him. <laughs> and he'll take votes from Graham. If Graham right. votes against it, Jamie Harrison's going to vote. Lindsey Graham just basically told all you people, a small business, go screw yourself. I mean- yeah. That's the thing is like, this could really help the Senate Democrats or the Democrats running for the Senate. Um, and it would also put some money in there. I, I mean, I, you know, but I know it's problematic, right? No, it's great. Cut two ads, place them a day before the, I mean, two days before the election, put them out there, you know, use all that money, flood the airwaves, whichever. I think it's a great plan. Yes. Smart strategy. If only there were people who followed it. I don't think they're going to do that, but um Let's see what we got here. Um, uh, let's get off a. Of, oh, here. Oh my God. This is uh, I, I, this is a clip that I feel like um, if Michael was still with us, I would hold for him to be on the show. For years, we speculated what was going on with Tiffany. <laughs> why? Why was Tiffany not deployed? in support of Donald Trump. And for, for many years, we assumed that she was, you know, she was the one leaking the tax returns or whatever. I mean, obviously we were just sort of speculating. Why was Tiffany so sidelined? Well, I think we have an idea. She has a tough time reading the room. <laughs> in the audience, okay? Some of her best friends when she was on Broadway, um, like unfortunately one of her best friends passed away from AIDS. And what I think is so powerful when my father says that he's going to, there will be a cure for AIDS within the next 10 years, there will be. And God bless. Like, thank you. Like, yes. um, wow. <laughs> Maybe you should ask Dr. Fauci. I, I heard that he knows a little bit about that. Right. Right. I mean, Imagine, first off, like the like immediately responding to that enthusiasm by reminding everybody that um, they are supporting the party that when the first AIDS crisis first hit, basically more than denied it, almost criminalized it. And then going on to say, like, my dad's promised a cure. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Back in the Broadway days. Oh, wait, maybe that's not the right tone to lead into this. Yeah. yeah. Come on, Tiffany. That's <laughs> Tiffany. Uh, read the room. You had the Marla Maples on Broadway. I missed that part. I can't. Was yeah. that Marla Maple? Who was that yeah. in the front row? Marla yeah. Maples. It was. You know, it was on Broadway or just hung around Broadway. <laughs> when she was a Broadway groupie, all of her gay friends used to invite her backstage. We're gonna cure cancer. We're gonna cure AIDS, and we're gonna cure coronavirus. Even though that's a fraud too. They're yeah, on Broadway. By the way, we're going to cure Broadway too. We're going to bring it back. I mean, it's honestly like, just like, oh, well, we're running on healthcare. Oh, well, actually, <laughs> oh, let's forget that. Oh my God. Oh my God. This woman. 
Doesn't Marla Maples also hate him? Didn't they go to war? I don't care how much it costs. Just get her out there. Fool. Spend it all. Spend it all. And they did. They spent a billion dollars. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Guess where I got the idea that Joe Biden got kickbacks. <laughs> Just get <laughs> completely. Had no. Tiffany. Tiffany gave me Tiffany that. saw him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, Isn't she, she's like a socialite too. She runs around and does her Instagram account. As, it's like a famous socialite Instagram account where she's at, you know, parties in Mykonos. Oh my God. That's the jam. She knew Hunter. She saw him. She was at one of the parties. She took the pictures herself. Is that right? Yeah. The, the, Tiffany has always been the one that I've suspected is at the bottom of all of it. Um, I was going to do this. <laughs> um. This is, uh, I don't think this, this segment one, it went exactly like Hannity thought they were, this is a classic, uh, conservative aggrievement, um, a, a conservative, uh, you know, aggrievement. They're unfair to us. Uh, they're unfair to the president. They're making stools that are undersized to embarrass the president. Here is Sean Hannity talking to New York, uh, the New York Post reporter, Miranda Devine. Devine. All right, final thoughts now with big tech, the media, the mob, as I call them, and they are a mob, uh, 99% of them anyway, uh, now going all in, unwilling to even ask the most basic questions of Joe Biden. Now we got a debate, Miranda Devine, on Thursday, and we've got another liberal a uh, member of the mob that is going to be the moderator in this case. And I'm like, I, I, how does this even happen? Why does any Republican agree to allow this presidential debate commission to be involved in any way, shape, matter, or form anyway? You took the words right out of my mouth. I do not understand why the GOP is not looking after President Trump. He can't do everything by himself. I mean, that debate last week with Savannah Guthrie was a joke. It was a disgrace. She just spent the entire time badgering him. And it was a setup from the start. He was sitting on a tiny little plastic stool that could barely fit half a buttock, let alone a whole one. And uh, he was uncomfortable the whole time. Whereas Joe Biden sitting there reclining in a lounge chair, looking like a statesman. You know, it's a it lo seemingly setup. looking off into space. Uh, all right. Final 30 <laughs> seconds, Julie. There you go. The only hope is that this is Donald Trump's uh, buttock. It's too large for traditional seats. What did they? What do they think NBC did? They like get us the smallest stool possible. Like we wanted, uh, like a kid size stool, but the same height. No, it's his, his buttock is too large. And and well, like why are they making this? Like NBC decided who the moderator would. This is a town hall that Donald Trump signed up for. Yeah, they. That's the other part of this is like they negotiate there it's not the gop first off the debate commission is you know as boring and nonpartisan as you could possibly imagine probably leans more center right anyways and still they have the they negotiate the two teams negotiate maybe if trump actually had a team he would know that and she should know that uh whatever the, it, they, they, they're doing it intentionally it's like the media they're all against them right the moderator, my understanding for uh, um, Monday's or t uh, Thursday's debate is uh, Kristen Welker. Who's that? And, uh, she, I, she is on NBC. Is she on NBC? She's on NBC and MSNBC. She's like usually at the White House, I feel like, in the, pre in like the press room asking okay. questions. I mean, I think that like they're, they've, you know, the Trump is happy to have like a, and she, it, it, she, um, I, I'm trying to remember which, who she is, but I think the idea of having a woman and yeah. Okay. I think the idea of having a, um, a, a woman of color is like they, that, I think what we're going to see from Trump is like, he's going to get very aggressive with her. This is well, like the what, setup. It's like the, the white house, because he, he has a relationship with them already. He knows what kind of questions he thinks that they're already, you know, out there for blood. Which, which is, you know, I mean, like, 
I mean, that is what I would suspect. Like, I know for, for a fact that Sean Hannity was desperate to have Janine Garofalo on his program all the time in the run-up to the war, constantly. I mean, and after. I mean, yeah. relentless, relentlessly courting her to come on his show so that he could attack her. Right. Because that is what the 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 formula is. And you probably got it. I got some of that, too. Oh, I stopped. I went, I went on his show twice. And the second time I did it, he changed the topic. And I confronted him afterwards and I said, you know, I had to spend like three and a half hours on this entire process. It was an elections. I can't remember what it was something going on a lot. And I said, it was really disingenuous of you to change the topic midway through and then berate me as a setup. I'm never doing this again. And then his producer came up to me afterwards. I'm so sorry. This is what he does. Um, but, you know, they kept trying. And I said, no, never again. Never. Right, like, right. I'm, it's fine if I go on with conservatives and I debate them in good, good faith, whatever. But not if you're going to flip it and like make me out to be a baby killer, because that's what he did. That's that is what they do. They love to attack um, women, younger women and women of color. That is like the formula for Fox News in terms of the way they drive their ratings, because it's uh, primarily older white guys watching uh, the thing who this is the way that they get back at every, you know, uh, woman that ever wronged them or their ex-wife or whatever it is. And so uh, there's no reason to believe that Donald Trump doesn't follow that formula. I mean, certainly that has been the hallmark of his uh, presidency is to, you know, which uh, which black person who's done something that is, um, you know, that I can point to and make into a national figure um, as, as what's everything wrong with America. You know, like it, yeah, Colin yeah. Kaepernick, I don't know, the, the list goes on. Part five. Yeah, but also uh, Maxine Waters yeah. and, and like, you know, I mean, just, yeah, yes, you meet Jay. And, uh, I mean, just uh, the list goes on and on and on. And it, and it's always the same type of thing. And that I, th- I wonder, you know, I personally, I think that is the worm has turned for him. And that is not going to help him. If he does that, he he is his goose is cooked. Mm-hmm. Uh, he should be spending his whole time being polite and then just talking about, um, I don't know, I don't know what he would talk about. Maybe uh, Biden's, you know. Well, I think this is actually going to help him in a weird way. I think having the mute will make him seem more civilized. I, I would rather have no mute, let him do his thing. And then Biden just chimes and goes, there he goes, there he goes again. Right. How do you expect this guy to negotiate with the EU, with North, all the negotiations? He's, he won't shut up. Well, but do you think, I mean, this is what's going to be fascinating about it. Do you think he's going to be able to shut up? Like, I mean, even with the mute on, he, you know, I feel like there's going to be a situation where he's like, I go, oh. <laughs> you know, you're just going to hear him off of like Biden's mic or something like that. I mean, is he going to be able to control himself there? Probably not. <laughs> um, right, That's going to be some debate training. Who's going to be his debate prep person? God. I don't, oh, need, I don't need it. I don't need it. <laughs> uh, here's Charlie Kirk. Got to wonder if like a guy like Charlie Kirk is like, well, I mean, he's going to have a career. They'll keep paying him, um, I think, right? I mean, the idea that there's going to be any type of reckoning from the Republicans, I think is sort of a foolish yeah. uh, um, uh, thing. No, they're going to like suddenly uh, acknowledge climate change because there's like an actual movement on the right. There's like Republicans young Republicans who believe in climate change movement happening that's like growing at a really fast pace. That's where they're going to transition. They're going to be like the, they always do that. They always uh, adjust. I mean, do they adjust? What did they, like, I remember the autopsy where Sean Hannity was like, we're going to have to, we're going to have to accept immigration. And that last, like, I don't know, like, I don't know, a month and a half. I feel like that lasted. Uh, but who knows? Here's Charlie Kirk. Um, talking about um, already anticipating, you know, the, uh, the gulags. <laughs> and this kind of underlies a deeper point, underlines a deep, deeper point. Pause it for one second. Robert Reich is trying- I, I, I am in no position to in any way make fun of anybody's backdrop <laughs> or- their camera is, but does this not look like he's doing like an after basketball game? Yeah. Uh, like, like, a press, like sweaty. sports post game. 
like a sports post game press conference. Like, uh, coach, why didn't you guys? Why weren't you able to score? We're not able to score because we weren't able to score. Next question. Got a Gatorade next to him. Yeah. Honestly, <laughs> right? All right, go ahead. Lines a deep, deeper point. When what Robert Reich is trying to get at here is that he's going to want punishment for anyone that dared to support Donald Trump. Because look, Robert Reich doesn't care about do. the hatefulness. Oh yeah, and look at that. the lie is Trump. Nice. All that's a bunch of nonsense. He cares that Donald Trump interrupted and disrupted <laughs> the socialist power grab that Robert Robert Reich thought was going to happen in his lifetime. That Donald Trump might have actually disrupted and prevented the central planners like Robert Reich from having the amount of power that he once desired. Remember, the left always judges success by how much power they are able to get. Oh, yeah. We and conservatives judge success by how many ideas we are able to communicate <laughs> and people we are able to persuade to completely no. different things. So Robert Reich. I got some bad. Who's going to tell him? It sounds like something out of the characteristics of dictatorial transitions of power. I agree. I'm reading from theblaze.com. Exactly. <laughs> Wait, wait, what? Pause for a second. Come. Pause for a second. Is that is that the title of a book from published by the Blaze, or is it what is he reading? First off, is there any like I don't even know what issues, honestly. I don't even know what issues that ostensibly someone like Charlie Kirk is supportive of these days. Like honestly, like you know, like I guess uh the Second Amendment, right? Like right? I mean the Second Amendment and healthcare as it is. Like, honestly, like, like, well, honestly, like if you had to list what now I know they're going to pivot back to deficit and stuff like this if Biden wins. But right now, for instance, when when Trump was asked on on Fox and Friends, what differentiates you and Joe Biden? And he said, well, not a socialist hellhole, whatever that I means, you know, not socialized medicine. And um, guns, guns and don't. um do not, do not, do <laughs> not, yeah, but not, not fund, do not shift the funding for police. Okay. Now, of course, like federal government only has so much ability to do any of that anyways, but like, what are the tenets of the Republican party today? That's it. I mean, honestly, do you, can you come up with more? Like, I don't, like, you know, it used to be like faux deficit reduction and yeah. personal responsibility and um, no Low moral tech. relativism, of course, they need moral relativism now because that's the only way they would say religious freedom, which basically means that we want a past to not follow laws because we're religious, but that's all going to be handled by the Supreme court. Back in my day, they would say moral relativism. They're not the, now the moral relativists. They do not even believe in like, there can be any type of objective laws that would apply to everybody. Mm -hmm. You have a different set of beliefs. You don't have to apply by those uh, laws. Uh, it would say, they would say now, but like, honestly, like to say that conservatives believe in changing people's minds, you're failing. Yeah. Just look at the sheer numbers. You want to look at any type of polls. I mean, bring up any measure that would measure public opinion about anything. And they're losing on all of those fronts. Well, that's why they're bringing up defund the police. Cause it's the one area they're doing okay with. And, okay. and that's that's a messaging issue. Exactly. That's a problem by saying the words that's defunding harsh. as opposed to saying um, redistribute some of your funds that you use for police and have them go to social workers. I mean, we've got concern. What was the other day, um, uh, Brendan, that somebody said, I think it was yesterday, some cops were saying or some uh, somebody was saying like, why are why are police officers doing this? It should be the purview of social workers. Do you remember that yesterday? Was Mental it mental health check-ins? Yeah, but but across the board. Mm -hmm. Here, let's uh, let's go back to uh, Charlie Kirk. So Robert Reich. <laughs> it sounds like something out of the characteristics of dictatorial transitions of power. I agree. I'm reading from theblaze.com. It's exactly correct. Characteristics of should change it. They are going to come what? after Trump supporters if we lose. We know that. And Robert Reich makes no reservations about it. 
that we need re-education camps for conservatives. This guy ran the Secretary of Labor before. He ran the Secretary of Labor. That we need committees to try and make sure that you shall never not toe the party line. Almost ideological gulags is what Robert Reich is talking for, is speaking here. Robert Reich would have been an amazing Stalinist. He would have. Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It sounds like something straight out of Pravda. Um, it is it is straight out of South Africa. It is alarming <laughs> how the characteristics of every single major totalitarian Marxist dictatorship mm. acts in such harmony with all the others, despite never trying to coordinate their activities. <clears throat> I don't even know where to go with that. What, and Matt, the ideological gulags, um, aren't you supposed to be running some of those? <laughs> well, it's difficult with people who voluntarily spend their time with like Dennis Prager to devise a way to torture folks. <laughs> the, the bar is, is so high in terms of what they are able to withstand. Exactly. <laughs> It's got to be like 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 what they did with Noriega, right? It's got to be like playing really bad music or something like uh, <laughs> Def Leppard or something like that. On repeat. Oh uh, my god, this is like does this sync with this audience? I can't. I, it... I I I think what's going on, well, I mean Charlie Kirk is you know is has been a master of getting like funding for people that he's supposedly talking to, uh, and not really talking to those people, but they are repositioning to getting to that point where um, they are repositioning to getting to that point where they are basically, you know, ready to be aggrieved. And it's, you know, it's going right. to be, it's going to be PC or wokeness times five, as far as they're concerned. But it was the chief of police in Salt Lake city, uh, says Salt Lake ah. city file that um, they complained that they're often called into situations that aren't criminal in nature at a press conference that showed body cam footage of, of police shooting an autistic child multiple times. Yeah, Kyle called in with that right. yesterday. Um, and, you know, when presented in polls with the idea that police should have a, a, a slimmer portfolio and funding should be taken from them and put into these other services, the polls are in favor of that, uh, you know, some people who say defund the police mean that. Other people mean don't have really police. Defund. But yeah. I think the majority of people who say defund the police, that's what they mean. Real quick, with Charlie Kirk, you know, in their repositioning, I do think it's time to acknowledge the fact that there's a little portion in left media or supposed left media, um, very far, uh, uh, very far left media, um, the Jimmy Dore land. I won't even say who these people are that have appeared in photos with Charlie Kirk recently, and they've re repositioned themselves as being pro-Trump. So I do want to take a moment to just acknowledge there is a little thing happening and I, well, we should be all, alert I, to this. I without take names. the idea that, and I think uh, many far leftists would take offense to the idea that Jimmy Dore is far left. No, no, no. I'm saying they position themselves as being obstructionists, right. you know, whatever, uh, the, Whatever their agenda is. The but, establishment Terrians is yes. really their ideology more than yes. it is any type of leftism, yes. uh, in, in my estimation, right? I'm not, and, just to be clear, I'm not saying Jimmy Dore is doing that, but it's people who associate in that little circle who do not deserve to be named, what? in my opinion. All right. Well, then you'll have to tell me later. and then. No, I, I mean, you can look it up, but like there is, there's a real... I mean, maybe this is a conversation for after the election, but there's a real strategy on the right to peel off whether it was always the case they were always going to switch to trump or not this happened in 2016 there were several groups that were for bernie that switched to trump uh, they were never obviously really for bernie um same thing except these folks have tens of thousands sometimes hundreds of thousands of followers and subscribers on their youtube channels and that's dangerous and if you know we're not calling that out folks may not know you know i think um uh i i think to a certain extent, like these anti-establishment um, uh, folks, they justify. The, it, it really has has got that that ideologically. I think that is really sort of what what's going on there. You know, like you know, there are people who say, you know, I guess like Greenwald went on Hannity the other night, and it's like that is. I'm sorry, like 
to discuss uh, what? Well, I mean, there I, I'm of two minds. I haven't even seen it. I'm of two minds. One is I can understand the idea that you go on these programs because you think you're reaching Donald Trump. And you probably are. <laughs> and do you think that you can influence that? And on some level, I think that like I am somewhat sympathetic to that. All right. I mean, I don't think that I would do it. Um, but you're not the person to do that. You're not the, the, you know, the messenger. Well, I mean, you know, who knows? Like, you know, I saw a door on Tucker Carlson one time. I, I don't know how many times he's been on, but I saw him on the other night. And I mean, he came off as a ranting lunatic. So I don't think that he would actually appeal to Donald Trump on some level. I mean, at one point, like Tucker was sort of laughing at like how out of control uh, Jimmy was like, he doesn't, he doesn't have the ability to sort of control himself. I don't know what, 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 what that's a function of. Um, it could be just a personality trait. It could be, you know, other factors that influence the, your behavior at different times. Uh, but um, I can understand. I, I, I mean, I, th I thought like, okay, if he's trying to uh, approach, if he's trying to say this to address to Donald Trump, like I think he was saying like, you know, go bigger than Nancy Pelosi on the uh, stimulus. Like I can, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, that, and good on Jimmy for doing that. If, if I think that's, that's the a case. legitimate, I think that's yeah. a legitimate thing. But I heard somebody, you know, and, and like I say, I can't comment on what Greenwald was doing on Hannity's show because I didn't see it. I don't even know what he was talking about. But I heard someone defend it as um, he has, and I can't for the life of me honestly remember who it was. I think it was on Twitter somewhere. I'm not sure. He's been shut out of other platforms. Yeah. So why shouldn't he? And, you know, like to me, like if the argument is like, look, this is a way I can talk directly to Donald Trump and I have an agenda and I think I can pull it off. Okay. All right, fine. Um, but, um, but to say that it's, that it's okay to go on Sean Hannity because you don't have access to other cable television platforms, I think is pathetic. Now he's not saying this to be fair. This is just someone who was defending him. And I honestly, honestly, for the sake of me, cannot remember. I don't know if it was somebody I knew or it was just somebody I saw in some thread or whatever, but I've heard that the idea before, like, yes, I think he's not, a, doesn't go on, you know, on, uh, on uh, MSNBC anymore. And at one point he did on, you know, Maddow show and da, da, da. I don't think that a, Someone like Glenn Greenwald suffers for having a lack of platforms. Right. But B, that because you've been shut out of, of some platforms, justify you going anywhere. Sean Hannity is definitionally anywhere. The guy He's, is a complete hack. Yeah. He is uh, a liar. He is disingenuous. He is not, you know, he's not even like, pretend, like there's nothing, nothing redeeming about him and that isn't detrimental to society by giving him any credibility with anybody and like maybe uh you know greenwald has a theory that he can influence donald trump's actions over the next week or two i'm just saying that it's not insane to think that but the likelihood of that happening versus the likelihood of giving what credibility you have with your audience to Sean Hannity. I, I think the form, the latter is, is much more problematic. That calculation is really messed up. You're risking, uh, I think very detrimental things by, by giving Sean Hannity any credibility. I mean, look, I cannot tell you the number of shows that I am kept off of in some instances, you know, like, cause, uh, but like there's, you know, people can see what shows I've been on and not on over the years. I've been blacklisted by uh, Fox. I have not allowed to be on a Fox show ever. I've been invited half a dozen to a dozen times. And as soon as you get kick, kicked up to the central uh, bookers, they realize they, they like, oh, yeah. Sam's on the blacklist. He's yeah. off. And then I never hear from them again. Fine. I don't give a crap. I don't give a crap if I never get on MSNBC again. I don't get like I would the idea that I would go and do, and give Sean Hannity pay any respect to that guy. I'll go on to argue with him. Yeah. And get kicked off and never come back. I mean, I'm willing to do that, but anything else, I'm sorry. It's not about you. 
It's not about me. There are bigger issues as to whether I get a platform. Well, and it's not even like, like I said to you, even when I was doing Fox a lot and CNN a lot, there were like three hosts when we as a movement needed that platform because it's 2016 to 2019, pretty much, right? We were trying to move the white working class voters into our, away from Trump. That was the agenda. I still would not go on Hannity because I knew no matter what I did, it was not going to give me the space to have that conversation. I could do that on Tucker. He would give me, you know, if you know how to work Tucker, here's the secret guys. If you know how to work these people and you know them too, they give you a little bit more space, but you have to develop those relationships. You have to ease into them. You have to treat them, you know, and they're, it's just like dealing with humans, right? And that's how you get in. But I, what I don't understand about this specifically, and I have to see the segment is, you're also reducing your credibility. It's one thing to make Hannity a little bit more credible, which I don't know if that actually happened. It's another thing to reduce your own credibility because I like Glenn, Glenn Greenwald. I read his work. I think 95% of what he does is, 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 is extremely important and way more impactful than 99% of the media. But when he does stuff like this, I suddenly say, well, what's really going on here? I mean, I think sometimes people make a calculation that I'm willing to lose this uh, margin of my audience to gain that margin of my audience. They're not gaining it. They're just not. Well, I mean, whatever it is he thinks he's gaining there. I mean, maybe it's just spite, but I think I think in Glenn's case, he has a specific agenda that he thinks that he can move Donald Trump. I don't know that it's a broad, and I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a left agenda in any respects. Um, I think it's, you know... uh, I'm not saying it's a right wing agenda, but I mean, you know, I mean, he has his uh, issue set and, you know, he has his sort of uh, professional relationships that are, you know, relevant right now. I would imagine from Glenn's perspective, he is looking for, um, you know, uh, maybe a pardon for Snowden, which I think is a, is a good thing. And he thinks that he can get that right now with Donald okay. Trump on the way out. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, and, and, um, I imagine also, you know, with, uh, Assange, um, I, there are some of the charges against Assange that I think are highly problematic. The other ones I'm not as concerned about in terms of their implications for the press. Um, but that's where you go on Tucker. First off, Trump is listening to Tucker more right now by all reports. He's not that's listening something... to Hannity? Are you sure? No, he's listening. Late, late, whatever. This is like palace intrigue. Who knows? Um, but you know. Word is Tucker's more in, in the, he's been pushed more into the inner circle and Tucker's way more open to that conversation than Hannity. Hannity has no, I've never heard him mention Assange ever. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but this is, I don't know. I just, and he already has a dynamic with Tucker. Oh, Hannity has mentioned Assange for a long time. He was like, when, yes. during, well, in 2016, Assange was, uh, w- w- all of a sudden was a, an American hero. <laughs> not American. Uh, but I mean, like Never. literally, well, yeah. I mean, Hannity is, uh, was very into that because that was a big, um, help to Donald Trump in the first place. Mm. Oh. With the Roger. Yeah. Um, Oh, all right. Here, let's do one light one. Then we'll do some IMs and then we'll get out of here. Uh, there is uh, voting, you know, we, as you know, there've been voting, uh, at like, um, uh, NBA stadiums, uh, stadiums. Um, what do you call those? Not stadiums. NBA arenas. or arenas? arenas, arenas, arenas. NBA. Uh, do you call those arenas? NBA arenas. Basketball arenas. Arena, stadium. I think both those were. I don't feel like it's a basketball stadium. It feels more like football and baseball arenas. I don't know. I grew up with the Boston Garden, so I was just like, it's the Garden. It's, it's a Garden, yeah. It's the Garden. It's, a garden. it's not even a. It's not even a baseball stadium. It's Fenway Park. <laughs> and um so they opened up Fenway Park for early voting and uh here you go here is a um fellow uh mass hole uh, at Fenway Park voting explaining why it's important to vote again I want to vote at Fenway because we've all been cooped up inside for a little bit and I got my donkeys and I'm ready to vote for Joe Biden, but I wish I was voting for Bernie Sanders. Oh, my God. But it's a team sport. Saturday, Mark the first. Boom. I love it. <laughs> I love her. 
Did you see that mask? Yeah. <laughs> Hats, socks. I don't know if the Bruins were in there. The oh Bruins were in there. Yeah. Bruins Celtics. Bruins were the yep. That's the way running. The way we she roll. should be a surrogate. That's she the way we roll. I got my donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. That's awesome. Oh, my God. Team sport. Team sport. Team sport. They, they, she does get teams. We do know that. Team sport. I would, you know what? I would love to vote in Fenway Park. That would be awesome. <laughs> that would be an awesome thing. Oh to my do. God. Uh, let's go to some IMs here. Uh, Trump sounds like he still has uh, COVID, says Mo. You know who else sounded like they had COVID? Like, Trump sounds sick. Hannity sounded sick too, mm. didn't he? Like he got a little frog in his throat. Um, well, Do we Kane, know if Lindsey Graham's sick still? Do we have any updates on that? Is he sick? Well, supposedly they, that was the, the rumor. Oh, oh I didn't hear. Oh. Really? He sounded, he looked like he was like during the hearings, during his debate, looked like he was going to lose an eye, eyeball. Jeez. Um, if he's, During the uh, debate, I should say. If he's got COVID uh, and he hugged uh, Diane Feinstein, jeez. Um, can you also talk about what Pelosi is actually fighting for on this bill and earned in, uh, earned child income tax credit, which will only help the upper middle class? Well, earned child income tax credit, credit is not no that does not hurt that does not help the uh, it'll help middle and lower income people who are working. Working, that's the point. Is yes, no, but I think there's also on. I think there's also uh, expanded unemployment benefits at six hundred bucks. It's my understanding. Like I haven't, I don't like, I don't even know if I've seen like a big write up of the bill. But there's also, I think in there, I think it's something like six hundred billion dollars for states and cities. Uh, they've got money for testing, mm -hmm. coronavirus testing and, and uh, money for schools. Um, but she is fighting for higher unemployment, but I think Trump has already got that in the, in his bill. Maybe it's 400 that they're at and, and the Democrats want 600. They also got the 1200 bucks. Um, those are in there. Uh, Wolf girl, mnemonic device to you. No me is sacred. And key is her middle name. No me key const. Did that work? No me, yeah, you got it. No me key, yeah. No me key const. Yes, you got it. Perfect. I don't know why I can't do it. I don't know either. <laughs> uh, bear at home too. I'm interested in debating you on your anti-capitalist remarks. If you're interested, maybe I could call on election day. I would need you to run the majority report as a worker co-op for the next two weeks. Let me know. I would need you. And on election day, we're going to debate that. That's, well, I got 12 hours on that day. That's true. Champagne communista. Great interview, Samantha. Just one question. Would you say that you can't really revise history itself because of uh, what happened, happened and there's no way to change the past, but you can only revise your understanding of the events? Yes, that's true. You can only understand your understanding of the events, of course. Thank you. I, I never got to ask him the question. Do you notice this, Nomi? The um, the idea of like, and Matt, you can weigh in on then Brendan, you too. And maybe it's just I can't tell if this is just I'm sensitive to it because of the nature of the of the of the authors that we've had recently, and maybe just because of my, you know, sort of semi obsession with. Um, with the civil war and, 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 uh, reconstruction, but it feels like there have been that we are in an era where a lot of the old sort of historical dogma or catechism is being questioned. I think, I think it probably may have started as early as the seventies, but I think definitely like a general academic press history is saying a lot of things that conservatives definitely do not want to hear, mm -hmm. uh, I think. I mean, like, I'm thinking in the last 20 years, like, when did Foner come out with uh, his, yeah. his, you know, uh, I feel like in the nice. last 20 years, this has been, uh, maybe it was the 90s, but, may, but, but I feel like there has been, you know, reinterpretation of, of events that has been more uh, prominent. 
I don't know. Well, it's also been given a platform. I mean, don't think in the last 20 years, there's suddenly a space to discuss these books at, at length. And, you know, you're seeking that MSNBC wouldn't have done before, especially yeah. when MSNBC wasn't an actual like democratic leaning company. Yeah. I mean, Foner wrote Reconstruction in 88. And I mean, I, yeah, I think that generation that basically started in like 70s, 80s, 90s. And I think we're, it's just that maturity at this point. Mm -hmm. crit critical studies. And there's an audience, a large audience that's very interested in it too. So it's just... Sometimes it's very hard to understand whether you're um, whether phenomena are new or you're just recognizing sort of a, or a lecture that Blight does on how, you know, historiography of the Civil War and Reconstruction has changed over, you know, the decades of the 20th century. And he said, like, in the 30s, like most of the interpretation was through a material lens. So, yeah. like, these things have like a cycle to them. Interesting. To your point. Um Tennessee poll worker fired for turning away voters with BLM shirts. Yeah, that's, that feels like that would not be appropriate. Sam, for Nomi Key, what if you think of it as a key from a gnome to open a little magical door? Nomi Key. <laughs> Does that door open with the fairy key or the Nomi Key? It's no, a Nomi it's Key. Nomi Key. <laughs> nomi. Does that work? Is that You're a good sport, right? Nomi. Key, right it's a nomi key Can you just rename your show the nomi show <laughs> I, I didn't give myself that nickname and the person nomi who gave key. it to me i really don't like but it's my nickname now so we'll just go with it it's, oh, it's right. like a mean girl in college she just started calling me you know and then everyone started calling me no mean shoot yeah well but it's okay can we call it const's show that doesn't <laughs> Uh, time for you were the one who told me to title my show my name. I didn't you were realize, like, it's I great branding. <laughs> I didn't realize that's like, if I had known, I couldn't <laughs> say it. Speaking of Ohio, did you see where, uh, where an Ohio high school assigned Prager U videos as extra credit? Oh, yeah. About the radical left indoctrinating kids in the school system. Eesh. Horrifying. Man, horrifying. Uh, Attorney Andrew, anyone know uh, what Adam Green is doing right now? Seems like he went completely silent after he tried to tank the Sanders campaign while the Warren campaign used $14 million from a single donor to survive long after their expiration date. I don't know if I would uh, characterize it that way, but he is, um, they're doing stuff right now. They're doing a couple of different things. One, I know that they're doing stuff to drive uh, the vote uh, for Biden, and they're also playing the inside game to try and get the Biden campaigns um, transition and then ultimately the administration staffed with a lot of people in the Warren and broadly left universe, which I think is a good thing. Crispy mm -hmm. cream, uh, Chris, no, Chris crispy. Hey Sam, did you see Eric Weinstein on Twitter in cons are a force this year involuntary conservatives are real. As I've told you, the failure to condemn Seattle and Portland. <laughs> Mayors acknowledge Antifa, admit to media bias or to level about cognitive issues in a near octogenarian has created the never Trump Trump voter. What the frick is huh? he talking about? <laughs> in cons. Man, that guy is just out of his mind. A bottom structure. In Republican minds, it's only bad if your children take advantage of your name if you're a government employee. It's not an issue for the Trump children because they're all right. business people. Hunter Biden was appointed to the Amtrak board under the Bush presidency with a Republican control of Congress. I don't understand why we allow Trump and Republicans to just lie, say he never had a job before Biden was VP. Right. Well, I mean, that that's also like just more nepotism, right? Where the Bush administration is like, oh, I'm going to do this. I, this is a sop to Joe. And, and, and that, I mean, look, I think all of that is problematic. It is. It is highly problematic. Um, if it was disqualifying, we wouldn't have anybody be president. You know what I also think? I think it's a it, it's to neutralize the Russiagate um, arguments. You know, it, it's I don't know. It just it just seems. I mean, th this is something Josh Fox came on our show a few weeks ago to talk about this in 2016. Josh was talking. I mean, he this was out in the open. People knew about Burisma. I mean, it was not something that was it was acknowledged. It wasn't necessarily a big story at the time because he wasn't running for for he was the vice president he wasn't running for president but the move into the ukraine to with, with, to deal with natural gas it's a segment on my show it's a really long story but the point that i'm trying to say is it's it was always about this this turf war over natural gas 
And the, the, the undercurrent of Russiagate is really a natural gas argument. And you should really listen to, it's a very long interview with Josh Fox. He'll break it down for you step-by-step, date-by-date. And it's a little mind-blowing. Right. But the corruption that we're talking about is not like the petty corruption where Joe Biden's getting kickbacks. It's more about U.S. hegemony and and trying to control resources in Ukraine. And yeah. Oh, there's a whole nother story about our foreign policy and Ukraine and dealing with uh, Russia and in the wake of the Soviet Union and NATO and and, and, and participation in the Arctic. Yeah. Yes, all of that. But what it's not is Joe Biden's getting kickbacks of $50,000 a year or doing favors for uh, for Burisma because um, Bi- Hunter Biden's on there. If anything, Hunter, Hunter Biden's on there as a way of furthering for uh, U.S. Um, foreign policy. Right. But what I'm saying is it is a way to neutralize whatever Russiagate. I'm just saying if this if it blows up again. This is their this is their avenue to neutralize that argument. People can't understand. Democrats didn't run on on the 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 the, the natural gas argument for a reason because it's complicated to explain. You can't say it in one sentence and one soundbite. But showing the it, it, it's it's like how can you make the simplest argument that makes the biggest argument at the same time? Who's running it as in terms of Russia? I don't understand. Okay, so what I'm saying is is. If, God forbid, this election gets closer and they start talking about Russian meddling again, I think that the Trump campaign is going to say, who are you to talk about uh, meddling with elections and, and, oh, and involving yourself exactly. in Russia? You, you know, you do it yourself. And so th- the, the corruption argument is a way to neutralize the bigger argument about what's happening on a global scale. I, I, I think so. I mean, I um, my argument was, you know, back in this time last year was that they were they were building all of this as a case to say that Ukraine interfered on behalf of Joe exactly. Biden. Exactly. And that fell apart because of impeachment, essentially. I mean, all of it fell apart because of impeachment. Um, and I also think it was their way of basically saying, like, there's been interference in the election. And the sort of when when impeachment happened, the mail in became sort of like got into like the the the, the poll position, as it were, for why this election would be illegitimate. But that feels like it's getting more distant too, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, now they're again, just- they're throwing things against the wall. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, we'll read uh, four more of these, five more of these. We'll get to discos too. Comrade Steve, yo, Sam, did you see the shooting over the weekend in Denver? Patriot rally scheduled at the same time as BLM soup drive. I did not. Uh, bronze plan. You've mentioned how bad Prop 22 is in California, but the other terrible prop is 20 significantly restricts the amount of people that can have parole hearings and increases the punishment on theft crimes. Vote no on 20 and 22. We're going to talk to somebody on Monday about 22. Maybe we should work in some other, um, some other uh, propositions around the country too. Tom Hauptman, per Politico, Biden's considering Jeff Flake and John Kasich for the cabinet. What the actual F you. I hope this is just like, like whisper campaign and it's not actually. Yeah, a lot of times you'll get this stuff floated for the same. Re- well, let me say this: the Biden Biden in particular has been. This is a modus operandi. In 2016, he floated the idea that um, uh, Elizabeth Warren would be his running mate, and I don't think that that she was even aware of it. He was just trading on that. He did the same thing with Stacey Abrams. Yep. And why they do that is it's. I mean, it's a brilliant move. It's a brilliant move because it signals to some cohort out there that Joe Biden is sympathetic to my views. Like I'd put John Kasich in a, in a cabinet and I'd put Jeff Flake in a cabinet. Joe Biden's contemplating it. I, I think I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. Remember I mean, team of rivals. Yeah. Well, th- that, that was, that was Obama and he actually did that. That was real. Right. Yeah. That was real. I'm suggesting that Joe Biden, now he very well may do this, but I feel like there's too, there's too much, there's not enough benefit for him. Like Obama had to do that on some level because he had to prove to everybody, like I'm not a dangerous black guy. And, and also I think his politics were there. The pressures on Biden, I think we both agree are going to be very, very different than they were on Obama. It, 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 even Wertheim was saying that, you know, in terms of foreign policy, I think on all, all accounts. But what it does is, 
if I say to, um, you know, uh, if I say to you, like, you know, I, I've got a, um, I've got a special, I, you know, to celebrate uh, the 10 year anniversary, I want something that really captures the essence of this show. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to bring on, you know, I'm thinking about bringing on maybe, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, Chris Hedges and people out there offense. Chris Hedges go like, wow, mm-hmm. Sam is actually considering Chris Hedges for like the, you know, the, the anniversary show that, that tells me something different about Sam or, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, and, and, and that's what Joe Biden's doing there is like, he's trying to signal to those people who are Kasich or flake voters, the disaffected Republicans that, I am maybe one of you now we'll see because his MO in the past is like, he's not, he's lying. You know, like Stacey Abrams, you know, was like his way of like saying like, maybe I'm more progressive, you know, on some level now. I But his natural tendency is actually to follow through on, on partnering up with Republicans. So we'll see. Know. We'll see. Um, country mouse. He lives like a King from the guy who embosses everything he owns in gold. And the final, I am of the day. Disco Stu, what would you call someone on Tucker Carlson hyping the Hunter Biden story? How does Glenn Greenwald sound? He is far more damaging to the left than Tim Pool or Jimmy Dore because the intercept has some credibility. Maybe spend some time on that. Disco Stu says, I had no idea Will Kane and Tucker Carlson were different people. All right, folks. Stick around for Nomi's show happening in like 17 minutes. 17 minutes. Sorry, YouTube slash the Nomi Key Show. Join us over All there. Right. See you tomorrow. Bye. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught. Between the truth and